Football games aren't the most popular of subjects, and don't make for the most popular of videos, and that fact will never stop me talking about them. I love old football games of all shapes and sizes, hell I've spent so much time playing the damn fins. And it is one of the biggest fins that's changed between the old days and now. Twenty or so years ago there were so many different football games. You weren't just restricted to Pro Evolution and FIFA, you had a massive choice. They weren't all great by any means, but geez, if you thought the 16-bit generation had a lot of footy games, the 32-bit era took the biscuit and banned it into the net from 30 yards. And so FIFA and Pro Evo's rise to a duopoly wasn't immediate, it took years, built off the backs of the bodies of all these forgotten footy games. And this video is a nostalgic whistle-stop tour through those bodies. A load of PS1 footy games, and a couple of PS2 ones too. They've all got plenty of quirks, more than enough to keep the interest up. Football games are important, and you'll damn well see that before I'm done. Of course, for a bit of context, it's good to briefly see just what the eventual Big Two were doing. It took quite a while for FIFA to find its feet in 3D, the first couple of iterations were actively terrible. I mean, just look at FIFA 96 here. A 3D pitch with 2D sprites? It's embarrassing. It took until the middle of the era for things to change. FIFA World to World Cup 98 was the first good one. This, however, is the best PS1 FIFA for me. FIFA 99. It still plays a bit like the original FIFA, with stupidly powerful shots and what have you, but it's got all the tricks on the shoulder buttons, which is nice, as well as stuff you don't have today, like the good old vicious tackle option. I miss the days when, either through accident, adrenaline or sheer frustration, you could shatter a goalie's legs with a Roy Keane-esque cruncher and get an immediate red card. I loved FIFA 99 back then for how blisteringly fast it played, something that the game doesn't really do anymore that still makes it a game worth playing. The game was arguably never this breakneck again. These were the formative days of FIFA becoming what we know and watch people smash their TV screens at today. The arrival of real players, of top level presentation, and most importantly, John frickin' Motson. It's a plush package for the time and the football's damn good. Konami, however, were the first to hit gold, back when Pro Evolution was but a glint in their eye. International Superstar Soccer Pro from 1996 is outstanding and had so much over FIFA. The sheer immediacy of it, loading it up and getting into a match in about a minute flat, and a clever mix between simulation and more arcadey play. No real players, of course, but then FIFA didn't even have those when this was out. ISS Pro is a bit slower than the FIFA 99 we've just seen, but it flows so well, and it was one of the first footy games to properly introduce the all-important through pass. If you can get past the early 3D, it's still a really strong footy game. Of course, these days it's mostly famous for the staggeringly awful Alan Partridge-esque commentary that I've made fun of hundreds of times before, and I'm about to do so again. Just listen to this. Well, the goalie had to save that one. That boy's got a steel scar. It's 2-0. Now, I pay to watch football like that. Great skill being shown. In the air, deep from the right. Perfect clearance off his head. He's over. And that was a start-up tackle if ever I saw. That's a dangerous-looking position. No missing. Straight for goal. Off the bar. Oof. Eat my goal. Let's see some attacking. It's nail-biting stuff. Scorchio. It's off the woodwork. It's a keeper's ball. Either team could still take this game. Perfect clearance off his head. And he scored! There's only one full minute of normal time to go. After that, it's down to the... There's only, there's only one full... Score! ISS had awful commentary in general. It would take until the PS2 years and the dulcet baritone of Peter Brackley for that to become even close to bearable. Still bloody good games, mind you. The battle between EA and Konami, however, one which Konami was winning comfortably, was but the tip of the iceberg. There were so many other football games, and they were far from cheap also rants. Some of them were just as big, if not bigger, than the big two. Some of them are even really good. And obviously some of them are awful. Chances are most of you will have played at least a couple of them. So let's go down into the Undercroft and look at the fallen goal-scoring superstar heroes. It would be flat out rude not to start with one of the first and biggest, Gremlins Actua Soccer. 
Indeed, this was the very first full 3D football game on consoles, with 3D players and everything. Actua Soccer was released in 1995, but I'm playing the club edition from 1996, which features every team from the 96-97 Premier League season, and nothing else, which is kind of a swizz actually. It is weird to play a football game where there's only 20 teams. The game itself is pretty bare bones, but it's not all that bad, it runs smoothly, which is a surprise. It's okay in most departments, including controls, nothing fancy, but it's all there. And there's Barry Davis on commentary. Sure, he's way too quiet and you can hardly hear him, but he is there. For the first ever 3D footy game on a console, Actua Soccer is all right. While it was soon passed by ISS Pro, it's a hell of a lot better than some of the other games we're going to see. Unfortunately, the series as a whole just kind of got worse over time. Actua Soccer 2 was utterly slow and unresponsive compared to the frickin' original, which is kind of impressive when you think about it. It was really not good, especially when compared to other games on the market. Actua Soccer had an important role in the beginning, but that was it. And when Gremlin was brought up by Infogrounds in 1999, Bruno Bonnell's company decided not to continue Actua Soccer, or indeed Gremlin's Actua Sports line as a whole. So it goes. Here's another one that might be familiar. This is Football, which was Sony's own football game made by one of their in-house studios, Team Soho. This is the first one from 1999 and it's pretty good. It's certainly made okay and that's hardly a given with these games. It has its own little quirks like having to tap the sprint button instead of holding it, making that a bit harder than it is usually. You can't just turn around all over the shop when sprinting. Other than that, there seems to be bits of FIFA here, shoulder buttons for tricks, and a general ISS feel to boot. It's certainly not a bad game and I can at least see why someone would go for this game over the big two, even if it was always disadvantaged by coming out so much later. But in spite of that, and likely because Sony were behind it, this is football lasted a long while. There were six TIF games all through the PS2 era, with the final one coming out in 2005. And I've got that too. This is Football 2005 is, yeah, it's alright still. The controls in this are very much like FIFA's, but again, with quirks. The game is still rocking the deliberate foul or get a player sent off option. And you can even dive in this game. As an aside, it's hilarious how FIFA has basically never had a dive option. Even Pro Evo didn't until recently. Again, it's the football that some don't want to admit exists. It's all pretending that football's a game where everyone smiles, and that adverts where Neymar goes back to the favelas to have a kick about every month are real. <laughs> Bullshit. It's about winning, any way you can. Winning, and money, and fucking diving. The thing that a supporter will accuse every single team of doing, but will never admit that their own team do it. Of course, diving is very hard to actually do convincingly in TIF and will usually result in a yellow card, but at least it's there. Like a little Michael Owen sitting on your shoulder saying, Go on, go on, do it! For the most part, I enjoy the football in TIF 2005. My only real complaint is that if anything the game is too fast, which can make it feel a bit too jerky. All the usual components are fine however, the AI isn't wholly stupid, and the game doesn't feel like it's working against you. Still a big problem in footy games today, that one. It's good to see that the series got considerably better over time, rather than worse like Actua did. And Peter Drury is amusingly shite on commentary. But alas, this is football never stood a chance. It was the last of its race, and it's amazing it lasted as long as it did, quite frankly. By this time, FIFA was at the commercial top, and Pro Evo was the one true alternative, and it was miles better than FIFA. This is better than contemporary FIFAs too, but not better than Pro Evo. And so it was always a distant third that never sold well or performed well critically. The Ralph Nader, the Jill Stein, the Nigel Bloody Farage if you wanted to be a twat about your analogy. The series made it through the PS2 generation, but it would not come to the PS3. And when This Is Football died, it was a two-party race from then on. Depressing, isn't it? Up next, we go back. Back to the PS1, and to Psygnosis's Adidas Power Soccer. This is an odd early one from 1996. Not good in the slightest, but it has some weird fins about it. Like the big trails that come from your player when you sprint. 
or being able to push the shit out of the opposing players. And everybody's favourite, the Mega Shot. Even if you fire this straight at the keeper, they'll fall down and the ball will trickle into the goal. Something tells me that this game didn't take football all that seriously. To be honest, you're basically forced into doing all of this. Trying to play football normally is terrible, and will result in being endlessly intercepted and you desperately hacking away at the ground in order to get the ball back in a purely unfun manner. Commentary is provided by a bored sounding Brian Moore, but there is a cheat for female commentary. I seem to recall this being a bunch of shouty women yelling a lot, and endless jokes about not knowing the offside rule that would have made any fucking large shake his head in disgust. Unfortunately it doesn't work on my version for whatever reason. The game doesn't exactly run great on my PS3. There were a couple of other games in the series that were a bit more serious, but they're not that worth looking at. This wasn't even close to Actua Soccer in terms of quality, and it makes for a rather silly but disappointing showing from Psygnosis. Sports just weren't their back, simple as that. Switching to PS2, here's the one true landfill game of PlayStation football, Club Football by Codemasters. How do you make sure your game appeals to as many people as possible? Why simply release 22 versions of the same game, each one only differentiated by the club badge on the front and some of the graphics in the intros and menus. And then do the same again for the sequel. And make an official England team version that's the same game only under a different name. Club football was made to dominate the shelves of your local CEX, whole rows of them, all there, ranging from the utterly common Manchester United game that's worth a penny, to the ultra super duper mega rare Birmingham City game that's worth, um, probably about a penny too. Supply and demand, folks. Still, there must be someone out there who is utterly proud of their full CIB sealed club football collection that they've just sent to the Video Game Authority for grading. This game is like a full-on shotgun blast in terms of marketing. One of those pellets is going to get you. And if it does, you'll have made a big mistake. Club football is complete trash. A completely unresponsive football game filled with so many things that inspire hatred. For example, you can never do a small pass to the player next to you. You just have to pass to someone 15 yards away all the time, and of course it'll get intercepted. Or how about being endlessly fouled by the computer for a half and then the first time you foul your player gets sent off? Okay, maybe that's just bad luck and sour grapes talking, but holy god damn it, this game is cheap and nasty to play. Club football is, well, an interesting marketing strategy, that's for sure, one that no one's ever tried to repeat, but a pretty crappy football game by any stretch. World League Soccer 99 then. This was another fairly major one by Eidos this time, with Michael Owen on the front. Woohoo! He's even got a little bit of FMV at the beginning, the best start up to any game for my money. Welcome to Michael Owen's World League Soccer 99, have fun. Doesn't his clear enthusiasm make you want to play the game? The only way you could have any more fun than this is if you were, I don't know, creosote in your fence or something. Anyway, the game itself is basically okay. It's graphically decent for the PS1, you can score some decent goals, everything works fine. Essentially, it's competent. By which I mean that while everything is good and all that, something about the game is just that little bit boring and you wish you were playing ISS instead. A bit like Michael Owen himself, really. Three Lions. Three fucking Lions. Released in 1998 by Z-Axis and Take-Two, this is the official England team game, coinciding with, of course, France 98. The whole thing brings back memories. The bloody thing was hyped to hell, even meriting a front cover on the official PlayStation magazine. For a football game that isn't FIFA or ISS, and is in fact hilariously shite. This is pure nostalgia. It was on the demo disc too, so you'd play it loads, wondering each time why it was on that cover, because it was so bad. It's even got 100 Mile High City by Ocean Colour Scene in the intro video, which is the best thing about the game. It reminds you that song exists, so you log straight onto Spotify and listen to it five times in a row in order to put off playing the game some more. It couldn't be more 1998. Ocean Colour Scene even sponsored the damn thing. Anyway, what's frustrating is that actually, 
Three Lions comes close to being good. It doesn't move badly at all. I mean, the players are as ugly as you'd expect, but moving them around and passing it isn't all that bad. It's a quick and neat game in the middle of the field. But just like Emil Heskey, everything falls apart when you get inside the box. The shooting, my god. So, you get a target on the goal. When you press shoot, you have to move it into position, which is difficult enough because it's so bloody sensitive. As you're doing this, your player winds up to take the shot in slow motion. Unfortunately, none of the opposing team does the same, so they've got roughly a full minute to take the ball off you while you're shooting. If by some miracle you get a shot off and it's actually on target, then maybe you'll score. Although in all likelihood you'll spray the ball out wide, or just hit it straight at the goalie. Although if you do that you might score anyway, as this little clip shows. The CPU isn't exactly strong in the box either, meaning that most matches in free lines end up goalless. At least there's extra time and penalties options even if you're just doing a friendly. You can remedy things a little by switching up the camera from its terrible default setting that turns when you get near the box making it impossible to judge anything, but that's only a minor help. Goals just seem to happen through luck while someone from your team shouts your crap at you. Actually I think it's gets back, but my mishearing's funnier. Still, the memories. My god. As far as shit 90s football games go, while there may be worse ones than three lines, it's the one that immediately sticks out in my mind. It certainly deserved to be the official England team game, that's for sure. Indeed, there are worse ones than three lines. Much worse. Here's Olympic Soccer, the official footy game for Atlanta 1996 with the name that strikes fear into many on the front, US Gold. They're the people who brought you the classic World Cup carnival on the spectrum, so it must be brilliant. This is, well, hilariously terrible. For a start, I know that I shouldn't criticise graphics too much, but, well, this looks horrifying even back then. The players are like stick men who got some big ideas, seriously. It might be a good contender for the single worst looking game on the PS1, full stop. I'm not sure if the people who made the game actually knew how 3D worked, to be honest with you. But hey, they did get Alan Green, the voice of football on the radio, to do the commentary, and he truly put all his heart into his performance, as you're about to hear. Whack! Oh, headed too close to the goalkeeper. Stun! A brilliant save! For Hidalgo. It's a scissor! Look at this once more, wasn't it wonderful? You know, it's at moments like this when a commentator really appreciates how lucky he is. Think, someone's actually paying me to be here. Calvera, a great save! This game kind of reminds me, what with the massive aftertouch and flying moves you can do anywhere, of a botched 3D version of the 16-bit game Fever Pitch Soccer, and that wasn't good to begin with. There is one fun thing about it though, scoring is so easy because the goalies are beyond stupid. With only a little bit of practice, you can curl one in from the frickin' halfway line. So it's almost fun to play this just to try and score some absolutely ludicrous goals. The game can do that, no problem. But yeah, it's awful. In that amazing US gold type of way. It's kinda sad actually. Just imagine some of the other shit that they could have put out in the PlayStation era if they'd had the chance. Alas, by the end of 1996, US Gold had been merged into IDOS Interactive, and we would never see that glorious label again. This is one of their very last titles. One day, I guess, we'll end up looking at a lot more of them. Would be rude not to, wouldn't it? Okay, Viva Football. This is one I really wanted to like. It's such a likeable concept. In Viva Football, you can restage every World Cup from 1958 to 1998 including the qualifiers. There's over a thousand national teams in this game, and you can pair them up against each other too. Brazil 82 vs Holland 74, Argentina 86 vs England 66, Burkina Faso 90 vs Luxembourg 98, you name it. What an awesome concept. A dream match football game, truly for the devoted fans and students of the game's history. I almost bought it back in the day. It is a shame then that on playing it now, I'm pretty thankful that I didn't. Viva Football just feels won. It's a very tough footy game, but tough for all the wrong reasons. Like the player selection being terrible, or the massive delay on a freaking pass, or the ball moving on the ground like it's on an ice rink, or the incomprehensible shooting. 
It's a game where you just hack, hack away and it's nearly impossible to score. Hell, it's a challenge even to a game possession. And it's not a nice challenge when everything about the game feels like it's working against you and the football on the whole is just gruesomely ugly. It's such a great concept and so much work went into that concept. I can't imagine the hours that went into compiling every single team from 40 years of World Cup football. I just wish that some of those hours had also gone into making a decent footy game. Of all the ones I have though, in the end, this is the worst of them. Onside Soccer, made by Elite in 1996. There's nothing funny about this game's brand of shite, it's all just incompetent rubbish. The most interesting thing about the game is the intro video. I mean, look at the place. See how run down it is? Everywhere's closed? This is England, right here. Everyone's unemployed, everything's grey and hopeless and fucking shit. Except the stadium. Everyone lives only for Saturday afternoon at 3pm. Mind you, looking at the place, I bet the team's doing rubbish too. They probably used to be in the top flight back in the 70s, maybe even had a cup win at League Cup, not FA Cup. But then Thatcher closed the entire town down and now the team's in Division 2 and on the verge of going bankrupt. Basically, it's Sheffield United, the video game. Starring Sean Bean. What a way to advertise your football game, though. No glitter in prize, no Sky, no Premier League. You can't hide the harsh reality. This is football, the true opium for the masses, the one thing in life that can, however fleeting, offer a little sliver of hope. I hope that every single person in this intro video has better days in front of them. But of course, the football is dire. It's sort of like the 16-bit game Striker, only really jerky and bad with confusing controls. I've never seen a power bar like this where you manage to get it up to 3 quarters strength and the player still lightly taps the ball a few millimetres in front of him. Passing is broken, kicks as a whole are broken, tackles… you get the idea. Even an indoor football mode can't save this game. If anything, that's the worst bit because… well, it's broken. Like the town. There's a big management side to the game too, but I somehow don't think that the game's magically going to get better through watching the god-awful AI hack lumps out of the turf. For me, this is it. A lot of these games are comically bad, but this? It's just depressing. It makes me want to listen to the fucking enemy on repeat, and if a game does that to me then it can't not be total dog shit. It's 24th place, 20 points dropped due to administration, no wins, record lowest score of the season, 9-0 away from home, stone cold rock bottom. Okay, that about wraps it up for this time out. Of course there's plenty more football games than this in both the PS1 and PS2 generations, and I don't think I'm ready to stop here either. I'm sure that I'll make another video like this in the future. But for now, Hopefully you enjoyed this guide to the best and worst football games of 20 years ago. There's nothing more nostalgic than really old sports games, so do please leave your own memories in the comments below. Until then, from myself and the rest of the team, or just myself again, it's goodbye. Well, it turns out some people do care about football games. The first PlayStation football vid didn't get the 50 or so views I was worried it would get. The people are interested. So hey, it only makes sense to do some more. Fortunately, there's plenty of football games we've not looked at yet. We've got 10 more in this video, a healthy mix of PS1 and PS2, and a couple of games that people were interested in seeing me cover. So get settled, eat your pre-match orange, and kick some tone-deaf DJ's head in as we look back at some rather strange football games of yesteryear. Now undoubtedly the game that people most wanted to see me do in the follow up was this, Namco's Libero Grande, a 1998 PS1 game by way of the arcades. Good thing too is it's always one I've been interested in playing. It's very different to most other football games in that you're in control of one player only. No switching, no nothing. Just you, the one player, doing your bit in the match, getting into position, calling for passes and so forth. So yes, it's the forerunner to FIFA's beer pro mode, only without the whole journey thing and having dialogue wheels in a bloody football game. Essentially it's a 3D follow up to an older Namco game for the NES called Top Striker where you did the same thing. 
You can choose from a bunch of players, all of which are stand-ins for real life ones. Klinsman, Zola, Zidane, Valderrama. They're mostly midfielders or forwards, so sadly you'll have to leave the goalies gloves in the locker. Even Maldini basically plays as a midfielder. I should know because he's a beast and scored a hat-trick against me. The game itself though is undoubtedly more complex than any other footy game on the PS1, and it actually plays really well, better than I expected it to. There are tricky bits, you've got to get used to manual passing, which is amazing when it comes off, although it can be tough with just a D-pad. Surprisingly, the game's not compatible with Namco's signature twisty controller, the Negcon, which might have made the controls fantastic instead of merely good. Player movement is very realistic with the ball, meaning you actually have to anticipate a change in direction, and the players are solid. They actually properly crash into each other, which is quite nice for a PS1 title. The most annoying thing is your teammates, to be honest. If you've ever played a pro mode, you expect to be often calling for them to do passes or shots. Calling for tackles is a bit much though, it seems like they don't have a mind of their own. I also think the default cam was a little too close in for my taste, sometimes it can be hard to pick up the action. Other than that though, this game is really good. A bit far ahead of its time and later efforts by FIFA would certainly refine the formula, but Libero Grande is honestly an excellent forerunner. The football's good, there's a lot of impact out there on the field, and it actually does put you right into the action. It's a tad more expensive than most of these games, but still dirt cheap and it's definitely recommended by me. And here's another highly requested title, Midway's Red Card, shown here on the PS2. It's a footy game with a difference. I think the cover, a recreation of Vinnie Jones crushing Gazza's ghoulies, says it all. It's a footy game with virtually no walls. The remarkably lenient ref will let anything go. Two-footed tackles, shoulder barges, drop kicks, headbutts, punches, you name it. All's fair in love and football, it seems. It's one of those concepts that seems brilliant when you shout it out loud, the sort of game a 13-year-old boy might want to make, but often such games are better in theory than they are in execution. But then this is Midway, the same folks who made Arch Rivals, Pigskin 621 AD, NBA Jam, NFL Blitz. They've got previous, in other words. There is a point to all the ridiculous fouling. The more vicious tackles you do and legs you break, the faster your special move meter charges, allowing you to pull off super shots and the like. This is an arcade game and should be treated as such. And good lord, it's fun to just do all these ridiculous moves. You've only got to be careful with them in and around the box. A whole bunch more tricks seal the deal and make red card into a pretty fun game. Good wholesome arcade football fun. There's even the cherry on top with one of the co-commentators being Chris Frickin' Kamara. Yep, erstwhile former centre mid and legendarily crap icon of British sports broadcasting Chris Kamara is here to tell you that everything you're doing is clean as a whistle. Firm, but clean. Red card is a very good short blast type of game. The football's never going to be in depth enough to carry you through a lengthy session of it, but a couple of games are more than enough to satisfy. It's right in the tradition of all the Midway classics I just mentioned, and a nice dollop of arcade tinged sports bloody violence. I picked the game up for 10p at CEX a while ago, and if you see it, either for this or the GameCube, it's a surefire bargain, even if you don't usually like football games. And speaking of Chris Kamara, <laughs> yep, there's a Chris Kamara footy game. It's unbelievable, Jeff! For the PS1, here's Chris Kamara Street Soccer from 2000, a budget title. I mean, Jesus, this is a dream game almost. The moment I knew this game existed, I thought we would be meant for each other. It could have been the beginning of a beautiful friendship. But, well, it wasn't meant to be. It's, uh, yeah, it's bad. This is a very low budget game, the sort that looks like it was made for 10p. And it's street football. Which can be good, but in this instance, it's just quite boring. The only real fun about it is the relentlessly chipper commentary which sadly isn't provided by Chris Kamara. Good pass! Bravo! Good goalkeeping! What a rocket! Too bad! It's showtime! That's the worst thing about it. Literally, Chris Kamara isn't even in the bloody game. 
It's just his name and nothing else. Out of the pit. Oh, and apparently Prague is in Norway, according to this game. You have to think that if basic geography was too much for the makers of this game, then the quality of football is undoubtedly going to follow suit. It didn't take me long to find a whopping big goal zone. Get into the byline and shoot in from that extreme wide position. Score almost every time. And when you find something like that, yeah, it's not worth playing much more. It's like a poor man's Puma Street Soccer. And if you ever played that game, you know what sort of level of shite we're dealing with here. Still, street football can be done right. For an example of that, well, we need to go to EA. It's FIFA, but not as you know it. Okay, here's FIFA Street, a spin-off from regular old FIFA from the EA Sports Big Line, when every EA Sports game was extreme and Superstar by Saliva was thought to be a good choice as a theme song for a bloody golf game. But this one takes it up a notch. Seriously, I don't think you're ready for it. Are you sure you're ready? Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Roll it! Holy shit, how extreme do you feel? Don't you just feel so down and groovy and with the kids? It's like every Joe Gabonito advert punching you in the face while OG Loke from San Andreas MCs over everything. FIFA Street is all about the tricks. They're all open to you with a flick of the stick and it's all about game breakers and scoring with style and panache. To the point where it's actually a lot more fun and even challenging to hilariously muscle a loose ball in from a yard out in vintage 4th division fashion. Something about doing a kick over your head and into the goal from 20 yards out off a Rabona cross loses its charm after the 20th time you've done it. Pull that off in regular FIFA or Pro Evo and you'll be smiling for a week. The game doesn't get that the same feeling is a bit diluted when doing it is so easy. Don't get me wrong, FIFA Street is fun when it comes to gameplay, fast and furious and really good in bursts, but holy shit, everything is so forced, the presentation are grotesque feet for the eyes, all the touches clearly thrown in by marketing men in suits. Ugh. The MC in over the top of everything makes me pine for the days of ISS Pro and Scorchio. It all feels so artificial. It'd be great if it were just, you know, more laid back, like a friendly kickabout should be, you know? Even if everyone's doing crazy shit, doesn't mean it has to be so in your fucking face. Keep the scenery, stick a nice bit of Wiley or some proper hip hop over the top, and it'd be just fine. But this is EA, and that just won't do. So it has to be the game of a bloody Adidas advert. Take away all the crap, and it's alright. But, God it does try its best to make me hate it. And honestly, as far as arcade action goes, Red Card is a better game in every possible way. Not a bad showing, but I doubt I'll play it again. Well, after all that forced coolness, I think we need to tone things down a little bit. So here's a PS1 FMV of a cartoon Des Lynam taking a shit. And that can only mean one thing. It's Eidos's All-Star Soccer from 1997. A light-hearted look at the world of football. Do you know what that means? It means they got Alistair McGowan in to do impressions of people like John Motson, Eric Cantona, and not yet disgraced pedo Stuart Hall. Now let me tell you what I think of impressionists. Have you ever had anyone say to you, boy did you see that impressionist on the TV last night? They were hilarious. Or gee, I wish that this famous impressionist would come and perform in my town. No you haven't. Why? Well because impressionists are not funny. Impressionists are literally the least funny thing in the world. I hate impressionists with an unending, undying passion. If you want to get into comedy but you're not actually funny... And let me tell you something else. I think that any prick who decides to be an impressionist should be put to sleep now before they get a chance to fucking breed the bloody shit. Fucking swan.
their cutty impressions of cut people like their cockle walk cockle walk cunt of the walk more like scum absolute f***ing wankers Right, let's get on with the game. Leaving aside the awfulness of being a light-hearted look at football, the sort of thing you'd see on the back of a bloody Christmas gaffs DVD, this game is horrendous. I do sometimes wonder if some of these games are made by people who've actually watched a football match, and this is a game where I wonder if it was actually made by sentient beings. Because, holy shit, the baffling, awfully done 2D sprites that make you hearken for the days of the 32X, the fact that there isn't even a proper shoot button, the completely brainless goalies, harebrained switching, comical passing, literally nothing about the game working, slide tackling the ball into your own goal from outside the bloody area, and oh Christ, a picture based menu. I really miss those on the fucking Amiga. There's more brains required to navigate the menu than there is to play the bastard game. And there's Alistair bloody McGowan all over it. I almost feel bad actually. He's so clearly disinterested you could barely call these bloody fins impressions. I actually missed the MC from FIFA Street whilst I was playing this. I have to say that this is, indeed, a new low. The poorest excuse for a football game I have ever played, and I'm not just talking about PlayStation. I can't see anything beating this. At least I hope to God that's the case. Jeez, we're getting quite obscure now. Football Generation is a PS2 game from 2004 published by Midas, who also published Chris Kamara's Street Soccer, by the way. It's, um, kind of interesting. It is basically a generic football game. You've got some regular stadiums, a bunch of teams with completely made up player names, a bit of stock music. It's a total budget title, the sort of game that by 2004 was almost totally dying out. They were ten a penny back in the PS1 era when it was still easy to knock together a footy game on the cheap. But console games were getting more and more expensive, and I guess it made less sense to knock together a budget title like this and give it a physical release. Football Generation is one of the last of a dying breed, a compilation of things that just weren't going to cut it anymore. As far as the game itself goes, well it helps to take into account that it is a budget title, it would have been sold for like 20 quid if that. So, you know, don't expect great production. It's very jerky for a start, it doesn't move well at all. The commentary is almost nothing, the presentation utterly without flair, but the football is serviceable. It's okay. I didn't notice any total howlers, I didn't find any goal hotspots or anything like that. The silliest thing I could do was try to score with a header from a halfway line, which seemed as though it may well be possible, but I couldn't quite manage it. And hey, that sort of shit was hilarious in Olympic soccer. So the game is kind of rubbish, it's off-brand cola flavoured water mixed with Glenn's vodka, a low-budget FIFA alike, but not rubbish in an awful way. More in the way where I can tell that the guys who made it tried hard with clearly very limited resources. Like a plucky team of part-timers trying to keep the score down against a premiership team. Football Generation is interesting partly because it's one of the last games of a sort that come the 360 generation you flat out don't see anymore, a casualty of the duopoly. I'm not sure if it's actually by the same folks who gave us Chris Kamara Street Soccer, but it is certainly a lot better than that. I think we need to up the glamour a bit after that one, and there's only one name that fits the bill. Beckham. In the PS2 era, David Beckham was the British superstar. Posh and Becks were virtually the royal family, every new hairstyle was copied by half the country, he was I believe the richest football player in the world, every fashion choice analysed punishingly in multi-page spreads, every kick for England, Man United and of course Real Madrid assessed and compared to one another in torturous detail. He was a media icon of icons, a odd position for someone who is, by all accounts, one of the nicest and most humble people you're ever likely to meet. So of course Beckham has his name on a footy game. Here's David Beckham Soccer from 2002 by Rage Software. Well, sort of. I really wanted to cover this game properly, but my PS3 does not like it. Not one little bit. So perhaps this is a good opportunity for a word of warning. The compatibility of old football games is not exactly great, either here on the PS3 or on emulators, say. It's better than you think it might be, but you can occasionally run into this sort of problem, and not necessarily just with low-end crap like this. 
You want to see how the almighty FIFA World to World Cup 98, one of the best footy games ever, ones on my PS3? That's how it runs, and it broke my heart. Despite my system rejecting everything about this game, I managed to struggle my way into an actual match. And the two minutes I played were not exactly great, with unresponsive controls and utterly worthless tackling, but then, what do you know, the game immediately crashed as soon as Australia scored. The most amusing things I can tell you about it is that from what I saw, David Beckham is literally the only licensed player in the entire game, which is something you'd usually see back in the early 90s, and the commentary team is Jonathan Pierce and Ron frickin' Atkinson, before that whole being recorded calling Marcel Desailly the N-word thing. Sadly, the Wonglish seemed to be lacking in this one. So while this game didn't exactly leave a good first impression, I can't rate it fairly, which is a shame as it is one of Rage Software's last titles. Perhaps it's better that way. But hopefully, in another video, I can make it up to them a little bit. I'm not through with you yet, Bex. Not by a long chalk. So let's move on. If one cheap footy title doesn't work, you can always go for another. So here's Taito's International League Soccer for the PS2. It's got Roy Keane on the front, so honestly I'm expecting some proper studs up take that broken legs out of this one. Alas, that's not what we get. Just another rather crappy football game to be honest. Oh well, not had the best luck with our selection today have we? International League Soccer does some really boneheaded fins. I find it so hard to follow play when the camera is constantly switching. It does it all the time and buggers up my spatial awareness something stupid. Secondly, holy shit, just listen to this fin. The keeper made a nice save there. He stumbles but just manages to keep the ball. I don't usually complain about this, but the audio, the sound effects, they're some of the worst I've ever heard. The commentary sounds like it was recorded off a phone, the game picks one chant and proceeds to loop it for a whole freaking half, and Christ, most of the time there isn't even a spot effect of a freaking ball being kicked. I mean there's bad audio, and then there's this. And lastly, it's possibly the slowest footy game I've seen so far. It's so unresponsive it makes three lines look like Pro Evo 4. Not that it's impossible to score, and your slow play will probably be rewarded, but ugh, it's like moving on a pitch that's made of rapidly set in cement. This game is quite, quite terrible, an absolute misery of an effort. Bring back football oh, champ. Oh, For our next game we're actually going to the big two again, sort of, to Konami land. I mean it's only fair seeing as we have had FIFA Street. But first a condensed history of the other big franchise. ISS Pro on the PS1, the wonderful game with the partridge-esque commentary, is actually considered to be a game in the Pro Evolution series, or if you're Japanese, winning 11. International Superstar Soccer, the original game that started out on the SNES, is another series entirely and continued on, but until 2000 those games were exclusive to the Nintendo 64. Pro Evo was basically a PlayStation spin-off. Come the PS2 era though, both Pro Evo and ISS games were being released on the same console. It is sort of confusing, especially seeing as Pro Evo games were called ISS Pro Evolution at one point. The town wasn't big enough for the both of them, and only one could fly the Konami flag. And unsurprisingly, seeing as the PlayStation was its home, and it had a pretty good reputation by this point, Pro Evo won the match. And so we're going to have a look at International Superstar Soccer 3 from 2002 the last ISS game. While this game is okay, it's easy to see why it's the final ISS title. It looks nice, probably better than most every other game in this video, and the football isn't totally bad, but naturally you're going to compare it to Pro Evo, and against that game this is always going to be found wanting. The brilliance of the PS2 Pro Evos lies in that silky smooth flow. It was playing a more in-depth game of football than anyone else, and it seemed to be almost effortless. ISS is somewhere more in the middle. It doesn't seem to know if it wants to be a sim or an arcade game, what with the touches like going to a close-up of the action whenever you try to cut inside the box. Looks cute, but doesn't affect the gameplay one iota. And it just doesn't have the flow. 
The football is so much more awkward here, with bad pass selection and a lot of your players seemingly not knowing what they're doing. It's not a bad footy game on its own terms, but compared to Pro Evo, yeah. And it doesn't exactly do much to stand out from Pro Evo that's effective. And so ISS was just one more long one in footy title that hung up its boots in the PS2 era. Although this one was for perfectly understandable reasons. Now our final title is something a bit different. It's sort of football, but definitely not as you know it. But I don't think there's any other way to cover it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Gaelic Games Football. The only Gaelic football game ever made. Probably. Now the best way to describe Gaelic football, if you're not aware, even if this is an oversimplification, is as a cross between football and rugby, where you can either kick or punch a round ball out of your hands, either into a traditional football goal, or between two very tall posts above them. Getting the ball in the actual goal scores more points. It's played with teams of 15, there is a goalie, and you can carry the ball, although you can't pick it up directly off the ground. The sport is very popular in Ireland and pretty much nowhere else aside from Irish diaspora. As you can imagine, the release of this game was a huge event over there. Finally, their favourite sport gets a game. It's one of, if not the biggest selling PS2 games in Ireland, and Christmas pre-orders for it even beat out the likes of Call of Duty. Unfortunately, not long after Christmas, the shelves were filled with returned copies of the game, because it's not very good. Playing this game is beyond frustrating. I don't know if it's because I don't know how the sport works, but I'm sure that the other players aren't supposed to just leave me alone while I try to tackle the other man, meaning that 99% of the time I take the ball off them and they retain possession. If there's some nuance I'm missing here, it sure as hell isn't explained. So that's how most of the game goes. Tackle player, they pick it up, tackle player, pick it up, tackle, pick up, and then they score. This is an experience I did not enjoy. And when in possession, <laughs> yeah, good luck. Obviously they'll turn over play every time, and that is if you don't lose the ball yourself due to the awful controls. I don't know, I kind of think it's germane to actually have a power bar displayed if you're using a power based hold the button down type of system. I don't know, I'm not a game designer or anything, but I think that's generally regarded as the thing to do. From what I can gather, Gaelic football is a pretty damn fast game as well. So why this plays so miserably slowly, I have no idea. So, on the whole, no, I don't think it's because I'm not au fait with the sport. This game is terrible. The commentary is occasionally silly though, tea and bananas and all that. But uh, yes, and frankly I think my opinion is bared out by the amount of copies returned by disappointed Irish fans, and articles from Irish folks saying how shite this game is. I don't think I'm missing out on a classic here. It is a bit sad though, the one chance that Irish people get to play one of their favourite sports in video game form, and it's a complete stinker. The guys responsible for this, IR Games, have also made games based on hurling and Australian Wolves football, and I dread to think on what they've done to both of those. Only one way to find out, is there? But that'll have to be another time. On the whole, the selection of games was pretty bloody Alan Hansen shocking this time out. It seemed to get worse and worse as time went on. And if you think that I've reached the bottom of the barrel yet? <laughs> well, I don't know, but chances are I probably haven't. Hopefully the next time we do a video on these old footy games, because believe me we will, I will actually manage to find some more decent ones to balance things out. For now, well, play Libero Grande and Red Card, maybe play FIFA Street if you can handle the bleeding wannabe coolness of it, and the rest can probably go straight in the bin. For now though, once again, from all of us here, it's goodbye. Okay, so it's time for some more FIFA. However, you'll be happy to know that it isn't me screwing around in Ultimate Team or anything like that. This is good FIFA. PS1 FIFA. Road to World Cup 98, which is still, after almost 20 years, my favourite FIFA. One of my favourite football games, in fact. And one of the most important FIFA games, too. This was the one that finally established the game beyond the 16-bit era, after a couple of years of serious slumpage. And it's still an awesome game to play now. 
so let's go have a look at it. Now, a full-on lengthy series on FIFA would perhaps be a bit much, but it is worth looking at the origins of the series as there's a lot of interesting stuff there. You might not know that the original brains behind FIFA belonged to two British freelance designers, Jules Burt and John Law, a man named Jan Tian, a Chinese programmer who emigrated to Canada in 1983 and would head up the programming for the game, and Bruce McMillan, the executive producer who would go on to head up FIFA for the rest of the 90s. It did initially make sense to develop FIFA in Europe. Indeed, the whole reason for FIFA's existence was because EA Europe were pushing for it, as EA Sports Network, as it was at the time's other games, were not big sellers. However, EA's UK studio weren't quite set up to handle development at that point. Believe it or not, they didn't even have a Mega Drive development kit. And so development moved to Vancouver, Canada, where it has stayed ever since. The early development of the game was always somewhat perilous. An American company, a Canadian studio, there were a lot of executives at EA who didn't really give a shit about soccer and didn't expect decent sales. Even with an American World Cup around the corner, and the less said about that the better, it still seemed more like a pastime to many than a full-on sport. American sports was where it was at, and FIFA was hardly on the level of John Madden, PGA Tour or NHL. Hell, at the time the original FIFA was being created, there wasn't even a professional American football league. Major League Soccer wasn't formed until the end of 1993, which as it ended up was also the time that FIFA ended up coming out, pushed forward somewhat in order to avoid competing with US Gold's official World Cup game. Even the acquisition of the FIFA license itself is an amusing story. Why FIFA? It's the governing body of the sport, the arbiters, the wall makers and so on, not exactly celebrated folk, basically it's a bunch of old rich men. Hell, it's probably down to the FIFA game itself that a lot of people even really know who they are. So why use that name? Well, EA assumed that football worked like most American sports do, in which the governing bodies of said American sports, be it the NFL, the NBA, the NHL or the PGA and so on, also have the rights to the names and likenesses of the players, the teams, the logos and so on. FIFA do not have any of those rights. The individual leagues, associations and teams of each country do. This is why FIFA did not have any real players for the first couple of years, because EA then had to gradually go to all of these leagues and bodies around the world, find out who has the rights that they need, and slowly bring everyone on board. It was a lengthy learning process for both EA and the professional leagues, and something that helped to focus the commercial aspect of the game quite a lot. One upshot of all of this, though, is that the initial cost of acquiring the FIFA license was next to nothing. If things hadn't gone well on the original game's development, it may well have just been cancelled. The original FIFA team knew that they had a pretty special game. The isometric viewpoint hadn't been seen in football games before, the action was way different and significantly more realistic than any other football game at the time, the animation was a whole different league. But it took a lot for the executives at EA to believe in it, to recognise that the success of the game in Europe would make it all worthwhile. Only 12 people worked on the first FIFA game. Nowadays, well over 10,000 people work on FIFA in some capacity, a core development team of about 100 people and literally thousands of data researchers and reviewers around the world. Around fifty dollars to $100,000 was spent on developing the first FIFA game, another crucial factor in the game's survival, along with its position in Canada away from the direct ties of EA's American mothership. As a point of comparison, FIFA 16 was budgeted at $350 million. You can't really deny how huge the game has become, and with that in mind, the humble beginnings of the series are always pretty surprising. Nowadays, an ESPN poll claims that 34% of Americans became fans of the sport itself through playing FIFA. Basically, FIFA does a hell of a lot more to sell the sport of football around the world than, you know, FIFA does. There were always certain edges FIFA had over the opposition. Any of its competitors, whether they be Gremlin or Konami, just can't hope to match EA's marketing budget. They can't match the licenses. The biggest edge anyone ever had in this department was when Pro Evo had Lionel Messi on the cover, and ultimately EA grabbed him too. Again, it's a long ways removed from the very first FIFA cover star, no lesser figure than ex-England, Arsenal and Sampdoria midfielder David Platt. Still, as far as the game itself went, 
God, FIFA was just terrible early on in the 32-bit era. FIFA 96 still had 2D sprites on a 3D pitch and was generally a miserable experience. It was also the first FIFA game to feature real football players, including Roma attacking midfielder Francesco Totti. Totti is now the only professional footballer from FIFA 96 who is still playing today, and is indeed playable on FIFA 17. FIFA 97 was a step forward, but not by all that much. A ropey effort compared to the competition, games like Actua Soccer and ISS Pro. Although it did introduce the indoor soccer mode, and it also had a song on the soundtrack featuring vocals by the commentator John Motson. <laughs> Don't believe me? Brilliant. We've got some funky stuff in the house. That is the fattest bottom end I've ever heard. Gradually, though, the pieces were falling into place. If there's one thing that FIFA's always done, it's to take inspiration and motivation from the competition, as well as things like features, of course. FIFA Road to World Cup 98 was clearly a big increase in effort after the lukewarm reaction to 97, and it showed everywhere in the game, even on the cover, which featured a young David Beckham, still on his way to becoming the biggest star in football, despite that upcoming kick on Diego Simeone. You've got a big old opening video featuring that one song by Blur that everyone knows and that all hardcore Blur fans despise, Son 2. No Motti on vocals this time, the rest of the soundtrack features PS1 favourites The Crystal Method, and there's even flybys of the stadium you're going to play in before each match. EA were clearly taking this very seriously. Anyway, why is this game so good? There's many reasons. First off is the simplicity, which is still something I appreciate. FIFA on the PS1 doesn't deal in power bars, instead the shot you do depends on how you press the shoot button. A regular press goes for the top corner, a single tap does a low drive, and a double tap does a lob. Simple enough and generally it works. Indeed it almost works too well, basically if you get the ball in the area and shoot, you will score most of the time. And crossing the ball, well, if anything that's even more deadly. If you can get a header off, it's a goal. A low cross? Yep, a goal. As a result, just about every match in this game is high scoring. You will almost never play a game here that ends in a no score draw. Is that realistic? Well, not really. But it is bloody exciting. And that's not to say that the defence is balked. You can charge, you can slide. If worse comes to worse, you can even take their legs off with a vicious tackle, stopping a challenge at the likely cost of a red card. And then of course there's all the tricks, all of which are available to everyone with a few presses of the shoulder buttons. Sidesteps, jump in the tackle, roulettes, rainbow flicks, and of course the almighty dive, which I find almost never works, but hey ho. When you bring all of these things together, goals are just about always satisfying, even when there's lots of them. They usually result in some <laughs> rather inimitable celebrations. Let's face it, they're a fuck of a lot better than being dabbed on for the millionth time. The next thing about FIFA 98 that I love is the speed. Generally I like my football games to be fast, and in the PS1 era, this was the best. A lot of other football games, including the earlier FIFAs, could be rather slow and cumbersome, but not this. It absolutely speeds along, whether you're on PS1 or PC or whatever, almost like the 32-bit version of Sensible Soccer. From this point on, FIFA games tended to be amongst the quickest around, although FIFA 98 was the only one to get it spot on. The next big game, FIFA 99, was if anything too fast. The speed was a big step forward, because suddenly the game was even leaving ISS in the dust. Next up, all the modes. World to World Cup 98 has tons of them. The World to World Cup mode itself is a good thing, because you can take any national team you like from the qualifying stages all the way to the tournament itself and the trophy. It's still a fun mode because you can do stuff in it that you can't really do now. Maybe you really want to take, let's say, Vanuatu or the Cook Islands all the way to glory. Unfortunately, you can't do that in FIFA 17 because they're not in it. But you sure as hell can do it in FIFA 98. There's hundreds of teams, just about every country in the world, and a load of club teams to boot. But of course, when I speak of modes, well, you can't not mention indoor football. Introduced by the previous iteration, the huge gameplay improvements of FIFA 98 make this... Well, it's... It's football heaven. Nothing but goals. Long goals. Short goals. Tons of tricks goals. Utterly ridiculous goalkeepers screw up goals. And obviously lots of bouncing the ball off the wall. 
It isn't indoor football unless he can bounce the ball off the wall every chance you get, after all. As far as the PS1 goes, FIFA 98's presentation is pretty good. It all starts with a bored sound in Desmond Lynham introduced in proceedings, and then commentary comes from the aforementioned John Motson and the sexist Scotch git Andy Gray. Of course you have to deal with plenty of classic PS1 touches. There's no one actually in the crowd. The players don't actually have eyes. The ball is roughly as big as a player's lower leg. They're all there, and to me they just make the game even better. Much like those silly animations. It all just gets you right there, doesn't it? Okay, you know, probably not. I probably just sound like a one manager type who misses the good old days and doesn't get this FIFA 17 with its dabbing and skill moves and jostling and finesse and ultimate team and packs. Which isn't true, I love them both in their own way. FIFA 98 doesn't make me think about doing this, mind you. Since the start of FIFA, the philosophy of the series has basically never changed. Indeed, it's the philosophy of EA Sports as a whole, to make the game as realistic as it can possibly be. Obviously, this doesn't mean that they're always successful. The way this philosophy generally works is to chuck absolutely everything in a bucket, even if it doesn't always play out logically. Everyone loves the time that EA clearly spent on players' idle animations in FIFA 17, or the realistic way they get up from a tackle and spend 20 minutes complaining to the F3. That's especially brilliant when it happens at the same time the opposing team are bearing down on goal. FIFA 98 doesn't have any of that. It's limited in a more traditional way, doing the best that you can with the processing power available. And it does. Even if the end result isn't a realistic version of football, it's an ideal image. A game where just about every match is exciting, where there's always tons of goals, where players effortlessly show their skills and goalies are left flapping. It's everything that FIFA Street wants to be, only utterly naturally. It was the best game for the time, and still one of the most fun to play now. Regardless of how far the series has gone since then, FIFA 98 is brilliant for other reasons. Both a really good football simulation and just a really freaking brilliant game. But hey, before we end quickly, we should have a look at the other FIFA 98. Naturally, a World to World Cup game was going to be followed by a proper World Cup game, and World Cup 98 is it. It's not a lot different from World to World Cup, but hey ho, it's here and I'm probably not going to get a better chance to look at it, so let's just go for it as a bit of a bonus. First off, well, it is a bit of a piss take, isn't it? This game came out only a few months after World to World Cup, costs the same price, and actually features a lot less teams. There's only the 32 national teams who are in the World Cup tournament, plus another eight. No club teams. And all the stadiums, because it's World Cup 98, are French stadiums, and there's no indoor one. And yes, as a game it is very similar. It does feature some changes. The controls have been switched so it's easier to access more tricks using the shoulder and face button combos. And this is also the first time that FIFA allows you to switch tactics during play without using a menu. And Andy Gray gets replaced on commentary by... Me, Stutukanthos Eporthe Chris Waddle. The only other really big feature here is the classic match, which allows you to recreate several World Cup finals. If you think, for example, that actually Argentina should have won the original 1930 final, you can do that here and change the course of history. So long as you win a regular World Cup first, which is bloody annoying. But hey, anything to pad the game out and make it feel like it's actually worth the money. But all that said, it was successful. I don't recall that many people complaining at the time, and World Cup 98 sold very well indeed. And I guess when you think about it, after World Cup USA 94 by US Gold, World Cup Italia 90 on the Mega Drive, and World Cup Carnival in 1986, I guess it's a better effort than all of those, I mean that's for damn sure. And in the end, well, EA had managed to reconfirm themselves as the top dogs in football, certainly from a commercial point of view, but mainly thanks to Road to World Cup, from a critical point of view as well. Bye for now. It's been a while since we've had some football on this channel, you know. We've done PlayStation stuff, the no touch thing, all that kind of shit, but not much for a while. And hey, we're a few weeks into the new season, there's a new FIFA on the way, plenty to talk about. <laughs> Sod all that, I want to have a look at some of my favourite arcade footy games. 
These are mostly all ones that I loved to play back in the day, as well as one that's kind of amusingly crap, and there's something quite funky and charming about all of them. I still file them up pretty damn often, so hey, maybe you'll like them. Here goes. Now, a look at arcade footy games wouldn't be complete at all without Super Sidekicks. Everyone's got their big SNK favourites, whether it's Metal Slug or King of Fighters or whatever. But honestly, I've probably played Lee's games more than any other, especially the original. As with basically all of these games, you choose an international team to play as, and you get easy enough two-button controls. One button passes, another shoots. Sometimes things get a bit more complex as time passes, but that's generally the way of things. What I like about Super Sidekicks is that it's all about getting the ball to the ace on the team, usually someone who's got a different look about them, one's a lot faster, and is definitely likeliest to get the ball into the goal. They all play so fast, and you can charge the hell out of the opponents. I mean, what's not to like? It can be a bit of a coin muncher mind. One thing about this game is that the keeper almost never seems to hold onto the ball, so goals happen pretty damn often and the best thing to do defence-wise is just to score more than the opponent. If you can get a good ball into the box, then that's very possible. And there's some really awesome sprite work in this one too, it's a real good game. So the original Super Sidekicks is the one I've played the most just because it seemed to be in every arcade around where I lived, but the best in the series would probably be Super Sidekicks 2. Everything about the originals here, but so much more has been added. You've got a much better camera angle, you've still got the aces on the pitch, but you can also select how your team plays, which is pretty nice. This game also features two awesome features that I wish more games implemented. First off, you've got the chance option in certain areas of the pitch, which allows you to quickly set up a long shot. It's kind of hard to score these, but really damn satisfying if they do go in. And the second is the penalties, which I absolutely love. Instead of the usual look, you get an extreme close-up of the ball as it flies from your foot into the net. I think it looks awesome, and it's a shame that no other game did it. This is one glorious 100 Meg SNK Neo Geo-tastic feast of football, and an absolute must-play for me whenever I was in the arcades. Well worth checking out. Sticking with SNK, we move to something that's not traditional football, but still a much-loved game. Soccer Brawl. This is a futuristic version of football. Suddenly, because it's the future and all, everyone's dressed in robo-suits, there's no more walls to speak of aside from getting the ball in the net, and there's a lot of violence. Everyone's got blasters on their arms, meaning that you can stop an opponent with a well-aimed burst of energy. Soccer ball is all about using the angles to get some nice deflection going on, and maximising the power bar, not just for the blasts, but to really put some oomph on your shot. And this is especially true if your ace gets the ball. That'll unleash an absolutely ludicrous pile driver that, more often than not, takes both the ball and the goalie into the net. Very satisfying. There's also a lot of aerial play. You can jump up and pick the ball out of the air, and then unleash a volley or a bicycle kick, which is great for close-up goals. Not many people talk about this game, but it's very fun and very brutal. A very nice addition to the future sports subgenre. Ah, Football Champ by Taito, released in 1990. This is a game that I've put a hell of a lot of 20p's in over years. Hell, it's one of the few arcade games that I've actually beaten in an arcade, which certainly didn't happen all that often. At first glance, Football Champ may not look all that different to all the other horizontal football games out there, but it's actually my favourite arcade football game. I love it. First off, the whole package has so much charm. It's full of great little touches. I love the picture-in-picture picture of the managers as you kick off and score goals, normally with one being very happy and the other getting ever more disconsolate. Little things like the flick of a corner flag or knocking down a photographer also go a long way. There's the wonderful foul mechanic. Sure, you can just tackle someone normally, but you could also jump up and knee them directly in the face. There's the brilliant voice effects. Welcome, kick off. Nice fight! Oh, fine play! Lovely. And of course, there's the almighty fat balding ref who waddles up and down the pitch, trying to keep an eye on the action. If he sees you doing those big knees or whatever, you'll probably get a card, but he usually gets knocked down by a player or the ball. In which case, feel free to knee, punch and tug shirts to your heart's content. 
Aside from all that, the football in this game is really fun too. Over the years, I have kind of gotten it down to a bit of a science. It's all about the lobs as opposed to trying to shoot on goal normally. Get those long balls up the field in a diagonal fashion and try to get to that one little sweet spot just on the edge of the area. If you get it, then you can do the most satisfying diagonal chip right over the keeper and into goal. So good. Other than that, it's a good way to get rebounds and the like for headers, bicycle kicks and all sorts. There's also the incredibly rare super shots, but you don't see those very often, if at all. Football Champ is a sweet as hell game, one of my footy favourites. Everything about it is fantastic. Annoyingly, we only ever got the one Football Champ game over here in the UK. However, in Japan, where the series is known as Hattrick Hero, they did get a couple more, so it's a good idea to show off one of the sequels, in this case Hattrick Hero 93. This is much like Super Sidekicks 2 in that the good gameplay is still retained, but lots of cool improvements are here. There's the better camera and the ability to use a couple of power-ups like super dashes or big sliding tackles. You can even spear your opponents now. It's a lot harder to do the diagonal lob, mind you. However, there are a couple of cool things here. I did actually manage to capture a super shot and it put the goalkeeper into the freaking ground. On the other side of things though, well... This is the worst penalty I have ever, ever shot in any football game ever. I guess I just didn't get how the PK system worked, I suppose. Still, this game was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I'd still go for Football Champ as my favourite, but it's a real surprise that we didn't get this very good game indeed over here in the UK. At least, not officially. Tecmo are probably most famous in the area of football for the somewhat pioneering Tekan World Cup, a game that I looked at many years ago now because it's a big part of the foundation for both kickoff and sensible soccer, one of the first really serious top-down footy games. It would also be silly of me not to mention SNK's classic fighting soccer as another big touchstone. Still, both games were a little before my time. So instead, let's talk about Tecmo's much less influential, but still rather fun to me, World Cup 90. It's probably fair to say that this game is a hell of a lot like Football Champ. It's strikingly similar in many ways, although that's more to do with horizontal footy just being the style of the time. That's why all these games are horizontal footy, basically. The same tactics that are used in Football Champ seem to work fairly well here too. Diagonal long balls up the field, get one of them in the area, and then hopefully get an aerial goal. Still all that said, I kinda dig it. There's nothing special whatsoever about the presentation, nor too much special about the gameplay, and yet, I don't know, it's weird. Whenever I think of old arcade footy games, this one, as unmemorable as it is, springs to mind. I don't know, maybe it's to do with the classic Tecmo style cabinet it often came on? Who knows, but it's a game that sticks in the mind. Who knows why? Probably the most average game I've ever reviewed. And now, a football game that stands out more for weird reasons. Backstreet Soccer. This is an obscure one. I've only ever played it on MAME, and I'm pretty sure it has its origins in South Korea. But anyway, it's street football. I always want a good street football style game, but they so rarely come around. This one is quite amusing to me in lots of ways, but it's kind of far from good. It's not terrible, it's just weird. First up, you know you're dealing with something not far from the bootleg world when the soundtrack is poorly constructed loops from mainstream rap songs, Will Smith and all that, usually accompanied by a lot of hilarious voice samples. The gameplay itself is mostly okay, as with most games like this, there's lots of fun to be had from bouncing the ball off the walls. Even more so here, as it's probably the best way to score. This mainly has to do with the goalkeepers being absolutely atrocious. Seriously, I'll have hit the ball from the halfway line, it'll be trickling towards them, and they just dive out the way of it. They are the worst keepers ever. Aside from that, there's special shots, all that other stuff. And one other really odd thing. When you score two goals or more, it gives you a bonus. A time bonus. Ten extra seconds on the game. Why the hell would I want this when I'm leading? A bonus would be to take those 10 seconds off, bastards. And that's usually enough time for the computer to go ahead and get the equaliser too. Ugh, this is a strange little game. Memorable, but fully doesn't get much weirder than this. 
And finally, we're going 3D. Now, I'd been hanging around the arcades for many years, and I remember being pretty well impressed when, around 95, 96, the new kids started appearing on the block. Look at all the 3D games that are suddenly around. And Sega's Virtua Striker, honestly, was one of the most impressive. It had a big freaking screen most of the time, for a start. It had proper TV-like presentation and shit like that. I believe Virtua Striker 2 even showed the top 5 goals scored that day in its tracked mode, which was quite awesome. Alas, I can't play that one yet, but I can play the original game using a Model 2 emulator. Looking at it now, you know, it's not amazing or anything. The controls are incredibly digital and not the most responsive ever. I mean, ISS Prolis is not. And yet I still get a kick out of it. I love the presentation, how the camera gets right close in when players are going on a run to the area. A dynamic to the camera angles that you just don't find in footy games anymore when you're playing. How the power bar makes some really killer goals possible as opposed to the usual 10 yard scramble you find in arcade games. There's still a load of stuff that's real fun about this one, and it was the first 3D footy game that I played to boot. It may have been a bit better in the mind than it was actually playing it again for the first time in years but it's still very good. And so there we go, a bunch of arcade football classics, great games to stick a 20p, 50p in or whatever and blast away at for a few minutes. Unless they're football champ of course, in which case you might want to bring a few quid for the long haul. There's certainly more of these out there that I used to love back in the day and who knows, maybe they'll make up another video. Or, you know, we can move to other platforms perhaps. In any case, it's nice to chill out and do some good old fashioned football. It's what's on the television after all. Bye for now. Now this doesn't always happen, but for this video, I'm crediting an idea from the comments. Back when I did 442 Soccer, I remarked that chances were pretty good that you could score a goal, put a controller down and then just sit back and watch as the computer failed to score, because that happened for like a good minute or so. But a fan of the channel remarked that, hey, why not try this with other footy games? It would be fun to see what happens. And you know what? He was right. So it's time for a little test. How long does it take for the computer to score in a football game without any input from me whatsoever? It seems obvious what should happen, the computer should just go straight up the field and score immediately. But, well, you don't know, do you? Scoring a goal might be dependent on my own errors, not to mention the AI itself just making the proper passes and so on. It's kind of a complex thing to program. It's also a good way to see how a game plays footy, and it might reveal other problems with the game that you wouldn't necessarily uncover. One important thing to note though is that if the computer happens to take a long time to score, it doesn't necessarily mean that the game in question is bad. Indeed, it might mean that its AI is actually quite complex and that it works with you. If a game's more of a simulator, I would expect it to take longer. If it's more arcade based, I would expect the player to basically be on their own and for goals to happen very quickly. It's kind of a case by case thing. Anyway, I have a bunch of football games here, some classics, some obscurities, some old, some new, some bad, and I'm going to test 30 of them. For each game, we'll use the default settings and two good comparable teams. Well, I've seen as a lot of footy games measure game time at different speeds, not to mention the difference in speeds between machines and so on, we'll use real time for the tests. Are you ready then? <laughs> well, let's go. First up, some older games. My expectation here is that these will be quite fast because the AI is probably going to be simple and straightforward. So, we'll see. First up, my favourite footy game of the lot, Sensible Soccer. No missing, long ball straight up the field, keeper fumbles, CPU scores and gets the job done in 9.5 seconds. The time's not a surprise, since he plays so fast and is very biased towards attacking. It's an arcade style footy game so if you're not controlling the players well, they aren't really doing a lot. Add lousy keepers into the mix and this is what you get. Next up, Sensi's great rival, Kickoff 2. Now this took a lot longer, Kickoff 2 eventually managed it in a minute 42. But this test showed a lot of differences in how the games play. KO is that bit slower, there's more passing in the build up, and the AI actually prefers to cross the ball. Sometimes a recipient isn't there, which means the CPU crosses and then the same player picks up the ball. There's other things too. Computer controlled players on your team do actually work at getting the ball back, they can even tackle. Which did result in one slightly silly moment where a CPU player got hurt and no other CPU player came forward to grab the ball. 
The keepers in KO2 are a lot stronger than Sensi's as well. Funny thing is, KO2 does look a bit more like real football in this test than Sensi does, showing I suppose that Sensi never aims to be a realistic football game. How about a couple of 80s computer games next? Match Day 2 on the Speccy and Micropro Soccer on the C64. Much like Sensi, Micropro Soccer goes by in a flash, a mere 5.52 seconds goes by between kickoff and the goal. There's no protection whatsoever. Match Day 2 is a bit more drawn out at 53.18, although a lot of that has to do with the game being considerably slower. Still, the keeper did manage a couple of saves. Lastly, there's a couple of arcade ones. Tekkan World Cup is again super fast, just 13.23 until the goal. It's the same as Sensi and Microprose. Fighting soccer is a bit more like Kickoff 2. The players who you aren't controlling are at least trying to get into positions, the goalie's very strong, and the finishing isn't that clinical. And so it takes a minute or two for the ball to get in the net. Finally in this slot, Football Champ lasts a full 1 minute 36, which is mainly down to the strength of the keepers. So what can we take from these games? Well, the line of influence from Tekkan to Microprose to Sensi is very obvious. You can see the philosophy where they believe that you should pretty much just survive on your own wits and if you don't try, then you'll get scored against very quickly and frequently. The other games are a bit slow and help you out a little bit more. It's interesting to see Kickoff 2 in action more than anything. The way it plays perhaps makes me think it's a lot smarter a simulator than I've usually given it credit for, seeing as I've always been a Sensi fan. But in the end, they are both very different games and Few things make that clearer than simply not playing them, as weird as that sounds. What about the 16 bits then? I would perhaps expect to see the AI get better and for it to take longer on the whole for goals to happen. And I sort of got that, although not necessarily for good reasons. This is also the first time that FIFA and ISS enter the fray in their original forms. How do they compare? Well, FIFA 95 lasts a long time, in fact, a whole 3 minutes and 53 seconds. How come? Few reasons. Firstly, keepers in old FIFA are very strong and it takes a great shot to get past them. Secondly, if you're not doing anything, it takes a surprisingly long time for the opponent to get the ball off you. They slowly shimmy up to you before finally going in for a charge. This actually makes stopping for a bit a worthwhile tactic in the game. You can easily kill a couple of seconds and pick out a pass while waiting for the CPU to tackle you. Also, the CPU's shot choice is very specific. It seemingly always goes for a quick square pass and shot outside the area. A few are saved until finally, one works near the end of the first half. ISS Deluxe took even longer. In fact, it took 10 minutes and 6 seconds. Why? Well, because of something I didn't expect. When my keeper grabbed the ball for the first time, I decided to not do a damn thing. And so he didn't. And surprisingly, I didn't get any comeback from that and the game clock just kept going down until it reached zero and I thought, well, I should just kick it out. All this actually does is prolong the game. All the time spent with the keeper on the ball gets added to the injury time, but it is rather flawed seeing as it basically kills the game. A human opponent could potentially stop it by tackling the keeper, but this will result in an automatic red card. So, um, yeah, that's quite a big cheat. Take that time out and I suppose it took around four and a half minutes for a goal to happen. Once again, keepers are good and it takes a while for a chance to form. Most goals in this game are scored by rebounds and eventually that's what happened here. The actual longest really was the worst 16-bit game I chose, bloody Pele for the Mega Drive. This one was just embarrassing. Not just for the poor quality of the attacks, but for how inept the CPU is at getting the ball back from a stationary opponent. Seriously, just look at this. Half the time they just end up fouling you anyway. Add to this robotic keepers that save basically everything, and you have an ugly game of footy. The ordeal finally ended at 9 minutes 38. After ISS, I decided that for the most part I should at least kick a dead ball back into play, and honestly I think this only ended because I was releasing it so quickly that ultimately, the goal was left wide open. Otherwise I have serious doubts as to whether the CPU would have scored at all. The rest were fairly unremarkable. More arcadey games like Fever Pitch Soccer and European Club Soccer once again left humans to their own devices. They were designed for the CPU to get pretty close in before shooting too, meaning that goals happened at 17.60 and 10.11 respectively. The arcade game here, Super Sidekicks, also went by quickly. Your keeper barely ever holds onto the ball for a shot, and so it took just 31 seconds for the ball to go in. Ultimate Soccer was the one strange one. Surprisingly, for a very Sensi-esque game, it took a minute 31. I mostly put this down to how weird the ball moves. 
It's very light and it kind of just goes everywhere, but ultimately it went on target. As games get more complex, we gradually start to see more issues with the AI, Pele obviously being the prime example. As far as a simulation of football goes, FIFA 95 probably looked the best, although there are still strange things about it. The AI does struggle for a bit when faced with a totally inactive player, before finally deciding that tackling is the best option. I suppose it's built more on reacting to the moves that you make, and so not making any confuses it somewhat. ISS Deluxe is much the same way. The result is a slower and more realistic game, which is what I'm expecting to see more of as we go into the 32-bit generation. The PS1 games I tried on the whole were fairly unremarkable. Olympic soccer was the quickest by far. In typical crazy style, the ball goes straight upfield, is headed once, and then twice. A huge looping header over the keeper for a goal in 9-12. Olympic soccer is a game where you can easily score from the halfway line if you want, and should be considered an outlier. Other games such as World League Soccer 99 are pretty laborious, taking a minute and 50. Often it's just a matter of waiting for the computer to cross the ball. Seeing as there's no control, there's no stopping a free close range header that's usually a goal. It's a similar story with Actuous Soccer 3, although a bit faster at a minute and 19. I was expecting a lengthy stretch from three lines, a game where it is notoriously hard for either yourself or the CPU to score due to the awful shooting and robot keepers, but thanks to a lucky positioning that made it easy for the CPU to just tackle the defender and stick the ball into the net, it's done in a minute 25. So what of the big two? Well, FIFA 98 did something that to this point I'd not seen in the game before. When the keeper got the ball, I left the controls as I occasionally do if the clock's still running, and this time the game punished me for delay of game, resulting in a free kick on the edge of the area. I've not seen this in the game before, and I've not seen another game use this approach to combat in such delaying tactics. Said free kick contributes heavily to the goal, which happens in 5063. ISS Pro isn't far behind. Although it's a slower game than FIFA, there's no stopping a delicate little chip and goal in 58-10. While both these games go faster than most of the also runs, there's clearly a few fins at work. The positioning from your team's AI is better, and there's even some rudimentary shielding as the AI tries to protect the ball from the attacker despite your total lack of input. Slowly, football games are becoming more simmy and looking like they do now. Still, the big test here is obviously 4-4-2 soccer. We're going to put what I said to the test. After 11 seconds, the CPU has its first opportunity. Saved. 10 seconds later, the keeper throws out. Another opportunity. Saved again. There's six opportunities in the first two-minute half, all of which go the exact same way. Shot from the edge of the area. Easy save. No goal. Seven more opportunities happen in the second half, and aside from this one scary moment, they all go the exact same way. Shot from the edge. Easy save. Finally, with 10 seconds to go, Patrice Loco of France gets the ball from the throwout. 442 Soccer has one last shot, and there it is. At the 14th time of asking, with no input from me whatsoever and 8 seconds on the clock, the computer has scored. It just about avoids becoming the only game so far where the CPU simply didn't score at all. In just about the smallest way possible, it's won. On then to the PS2, where we have a whole mix of results. The quickest game this time around was Lissis Football 2005, in 1519. While the CPU does try to get in defensive positions, there is still a wide open space in the middle, and so the opponent scores with their first shot. UEFA Challenge, one of Gremlin's final titles, is also pretty speedy, done in 3365. It may look like I'm controlling the defender here, but honestly I'm not. It's trying desperately to track back as standard, giving you a reasonable amount of help. Still, I'd obviously need to take control to have any hope of stopping the goal. Sensi is also back in the form of its 2006 edition. The game is similar to the one of old, although the attacking isn't quite as strong. We do see some silly shot choices, also some freakish teleportation. Still, they get close and score in 54-46. And similarly to the old PS1 games, club football relies on a free header from a corner to get the job done in a minute 04. What about the big two? We've got FIFA 2002 here, along with good old Pro Evo 4. And the two games are never closer. Both do the job in 1 minute 17, with FIFA 2 5 tenths of a second longer. FIFA is becoming more protective. We're now seeing the defending AI get really close to attackers and actually win the ball a fair deal. Still, once a defender gets the ball in the area, 
I can't do anything and it's not difficult for the CPU to tackle and slot in a close range opportunity. Pro Evo 4's AI also tries a little, opting for decent positions and even doing a little one in with the ball without guidance, but once again a corner proves to be lethal. The attacking in Pro Evo 4 is however a ton more varied than any other game we've seen so far. As for the Wooden Spoon Award, well that goes to Virtua Pro Football, Sega's complete rip-off of Pro Evolution Soccer. The game takes 3 minutes and 56 seconds to score but not for any good reason, the attack is just toothless. Like Pele, sometimes the CPU just fouls me for no reason when trying to take the ball. Once they even manage to run the ball out of play despite not being in any way challenged. It's kind of silly really. But as has often been the case, a cross finally allows for the free header that mercifully ends the process. What we've seen for the most part is the gradual evolution of teammates AI. In the beginning the rest of your team just didn't do anything. Slowly but surely they started to occupy their own zones, something that at least means that when control does switch to that player, they start in a fairly decent position that gives you a chance at the attacker. Gradually we've seen them do more, automatically track back, get closer to attackers, even intercept the ball at some points. These are all things that usually you're not supposed to notice in game, but when you don't play you can see them at work. Obviously we should see even more as we get closer to the modern day. But seeing as after the PS2 era we only have two games left, we may as well just skip to the here and now. And so let's look at Pro Evo Soccer 2017 and FIFA 17. In Pro Evo 2017 lots has changed, defenders now move with attackers a lot more and they move laterally to them, blocking them off. They get in the way even without your input. There's even one point here where a cross, once so lethal, is actually defended. The attacking play has also changed somewhat. Usually we've just seen teams bomb straight forward, but Pro Evo takes its time even when the defender in front of them isn't doing anything. You'll notice how little space there is in the area generally. Even without your control, players still fill the box and make life difficult for the attackers. But despite all of that, it doesn't take long. The ball gets to Neymar in the area, and really when he's got it here, it doesn't matter if I'm controlling or not. The game scores in a minute 07. Neymar is, well, he's Neymar, and he doesn't care about my experiment or how good the AI's defending is supposed to be. Ultimately, Pro Evo 2017 gives the same result as most every other Konami football game we've tried out. And so, FIFA 17, a game where defending yourself can often be a pain and is hard as hell to learn. Maybe not playing's a better idea. I've chosen to play against Germany, a pretty strong attacking team, against France, who are of a similar level. The game starts and, well just look at some of this. Put simply, FIFA 17 is a defensive machine. The defence will do anything. Crosses come in, not only will they defend them, they'll clear them. Attackers head in for goal, the AI defence will track them and when they get the opportunity, they'll tackle. They'll intercept passes a lot of the time. The keeper will pounce on any ball that goes astray and generally they'll just be a nuisance. The system is on the whole very polished. Germany are reduced to only a few opportunities, not because their attacking is bad, but because the defence is harassing them, closing them down, intercepting passes, blocking and even tackling without any input from me whatsoever. The only thing I'm doing is kicking the ball back into play with the keeper, and he's pretty good as well. I mean look, here's the stats at the end of the first half. A couple of strange things. In a game where I wasn't playing, Germany had 56% of possession and France had 44 Surely you would expect that gap to be much wider? You can see the two tackles too, which happened completely off my team's own accord. And we have a stat of 54% for pass accuracy. Where did that come from? At what point did my team actually pass a ball? I can see a couple of examples perhaps, but still, geez. Substitution for the second half goes in similar fashion. The AI Hello. defense in FIFA is just that good. For most people it's actually way better than trying to defend the goal yourself. It can be used in other ways, such as letting the defence harass the attacking team on their own, while you control a midfielder and close down the attack from behind. That can be very effective. Finally, in the 68th in-game minute and after 13 minutes and 2 seconds of real time, Germany score. And they still had to work at it, finally producing a pass that split the defence and allowed a clear scoring opportunity. The most modern game on the list took by far the longest to produce a goal. The question with FIFA 17 really is, you know, is it all just too much help? If it's more effective to just let the CPU defend for you than it is to try and do it yourself, can that really be called a good thing? 
It's something that a lot of people complain about playing against online. It's pretty hard for a regular player to break this sort of defence down, and it seems to go against EA's attempts to position FIFA as a major eSport to have a defensive system that needs barely any input from you. Still, it's certainly produced an interesting result at the end of the experiment. Shows how far we've come. So what have we learned? Well, let's have a look at some stats, shall we? On the whole, I spent a little over an hour watching the computer score against a defence that consisted purely of its own teammate AI. The shortest time it took for a game to score was MicroPro Soccer with a mere 5.52 seconds, and the longest was FIFA 17 at 13 minutes 2 seconds. I have a chart here. The games have been sorted chronologically. Kind of interesting to see them all laid out like this, I'm sure you'll agree. Now this whole idea naturally started out as a bit of fun, although it actually did turn a little bit technical towards the end. At first my natural thought was that surely if the computer took a long time to score, that that would be a bad thing, as it meant that the CPU's attacking wasn't competent. And in some cases, such as 442 Soccer, Pele and Virtua Pro Football, that was pretty much correct. But then I started thinking about the other side too, the one that you don't often see talked about much in football games. What we have here is a demonstration of how teammate AI has evolved, or how AI in general has evolved even. It's always been there to some degree and not playing the game definitely shows it off. You don't think about it because you automatically think that if you're not doing anything then nothing's going on, but in truth things do have to happen. In the early days it was just a matter of positioning, making sure that the rest of the players you're not controlling stay in something that's recognisably a formation, dependent on where the ball is on the pitch. In something like Sensi or Kickoff, every computer controlled player has a zone that they're in until the human control switches to them, and if they weren't in that zone, then the play would suffer because we would take control of them and they wouldn't be in a position to affect the play. For most games in the 8 to 16 bit eras, that's usually the case, just get in a good position. It's not something you'd notice at all when playing, but you'd definitely notice it if it wasn't implemented. As games get more modern, they start to do a bit more. You gradually start to see things like automatic shielding, or players behaving like they would in a normal game. Maybe they'll force the opposition out wide, or they'll start to fill the box. Of course, a lot of what your teammates AI is doing is also dependent on what you're doing. They've also got to get themselves in positions where once you get the ball, you can make passes to them and whatnot. And so if you're not doing anything well, things are liable to go a bit wonky. But still, they tend to get closer to the action rather than just staying in a specific zone. And then, yeah, you eventually end up with something like FIFA 17, one where it's certainly something to see just how much the AI has evolved after all that's gone before, to the point where, as mentioned, it might just be a little too much. I mean, it's not that a player doesn't know what to expect out of a largely AI-controlled defence, it's that they're so good that you really struggle to do anything against it. And that's before a player makes changes to the AI's behaviour. If I'd switched them to defensive, perhaps the opposing CPU wouldn't have scored at all. One thing that you can see quite nakedly though is how the games play. And hell, maybe that's something you could do with other games from now on. At least ones that have some sort of squad-based competitive goal as opposed to like a platform or something. It is interesting to see how a computer goes about completing a seemingly straightforward task without affecting it in any way. Try it out for yourself. Maybe it'll change the way that you play football games in the future, and it'll make you a better player. Okay, I mean, it probably won't. Almost definitely won't, in fact. But at least it won't be in any way stressful. Bye for now. Now we've been covering some pretty major games in the past few weeks or so. Elite, Jet Set Willy, Civilization. I'm gonna kinda take a break from that to cover something a bit more straightforward. A football management game from 25 years ago that I happen to have a soft spot for. It's Ultimate Soccer Manager. Seriously, this is actually quite a lot of fun. And there are some rather curious things about it too. I mean, it is pretty much the only footy management game out there that legitimately allows you to cheat like hell, after all. Ultimate Soccer Manager, or USM for short, is a game by Impressions, a European studio that are perhaps a bit more known for city building than they are for anything football related. Chances are you probably know them for at least one of the Caesar games, for example. 
It is one of, well, many games on the Amiga, or indeed PC, that allows you to don that sheepskin coat, light that big cigar, wear those fancy rings and manage your favourite team to the top of the league. Back in the day there was an absolute ton of football management games. Catnip for football lovers and statos everywhere, and many of them with their own unique little quirks. Some were lousy, some were more dependable, and of course there was one that ruled the roost, that being what was known back then as championship manager, and is of course now football manager. Of the many pretenders to the throne of CM, your humble host loved two in particular. Gremlin's brilliant Premier Manager 3 is just as good as this game, and has been covered before some years back. And Ultimate Soccer Manager, well, that's the other one. When it comes to quirks, this game has more than most. A lot of things you can do here aren't necessarily things a regular manager would ever touch. After picking your team and entering a name, you come straight into the stadium screen. And guess what? You can build on it. This part is an absolute haven for micromanagers. You can put roads down, everything from program stands to burger bars and pubs. You can choose the price of a pint and a scarf. You don't have a lot of space to work with, but it is quite amusing that impressions would still squeeze a bit of their city building nous into a football management game. If this side of the game interests you, then you're probably best off going for a conference level team, as their grounds tend to be emptier and thus give you a lot more space to work with. It's all well and good picking Manchester United, but naturally their ground is kinda packed and you can barely do anything new there. Another thing that's odd about Ultimate Soccer Manager? Well, there's all the animations and the picture-based interface. Now, European games, especially sports ones, having picture-based menus and interfaces is hardly uncommon, and nor is it uncommon for these menus to be a massive and stupidly cryptic pain in the arse. If there is one European gaming quirk that I utterly bloody hate, it's picture-based menus. I cannot stand them, and I would love to meet whoever it was who first thought they were a good idea. Just give me a name, give me a name, so that I can deliver a James Hunt style knuckle sandwich to their face. Not really, but they annoy me. And yet, I have no problem with the unnecessary flashiness of USM's interface, with all of its lovingly crafted football deluxe paintings that you could hang on the wall, maybe not, but you might do, and all the animations. It does help that there's text to go along with it all so you're not actually confused as to what you're doing or where you're going, but it's fun too, instead of just having a generic readout of matches and results, to go on the game's version of teletext, or read a newspaper, or get a fax, or play with the chairman's hair. There's something stupidly satisfying about it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the chairman's office and kept turning the light on and off. Why? Because, well, you can do it. Some of the more credulous may think that all this football ground building and these fancy animations are a little bit gimmicky. I mean, what about the actual football itself? Well, it's okay. It's not as detailed as something like Premier Manager is. In fact, there's no options at all for individual players' tactics during matches, just a few options for the whole team and some formations to throw around. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter too much what you choose. Once you've signed some good players, which isn't that hard, or trained the ones you already have up to standard, you kind of just start winning most of the matches you play anyway. The match engine itself is pretty fine for the time, and looks better than a lot of other footy manny games, as the venerable Steve Farragut called them, and there's a bit more fun gimmickry to be had when you get accosted by journalists after the game for a quote, but the actual meat of the game? Yeah, I won't deny that there's not a lot of it. It's basic, but it is still fast, and I have a soft spot for it. Sure, a lot of that probably comes down to playing the game back in the day, and I doubt many folks are going to dig this game up based on my chat about it, but there is one other feature of the game that does make it stand out. Ultimate Soccer Manager has a... a dark side. It gives you the chance to be a dodgy dealer, it's the only football management game I know that allows you to do this. You have three options when it comes to being a dodgy geezer. The first is betting on your matches. Simply betting on your matches is something that you can do without any risk by the money you put down and won't get you into trouble, but it certainly makes things more interesting when there's more than just a position in the league riding on the outcome of a game. The other two things, well, they're much more serious. First, you can offer another club a bun, 
a financial sweetener that will allow you to sign basically any of that club's players if they accept it. The other one is literally rigging matches. Offer your next opponent enough cash and they might just throw it. Throw the match. How gloriously corrupt is that? And I doubt it's something that would ever be included in any footy management game today. Of course, there can be consequences for this sort of corrupt behaviour. A lot of teams will utterly reject you overtures, and the more you do it, the more chance there is that, in the end, you'll be fired and nicked for your treacherous and shifty ways, no matter how well you're doing in the league. Such is life. Even if there's not an awful lot to be said about the actual football side of Ultimate Soccer Manager, these silly little quirks and gimmicks have always made it a game that kind of sticks out in my mind, even all these years later. In many cases, it's the only football game I know that does allow you to actually build your own ground, or to try and cheat and wheeler deal your way to victory. These are odd and amusing things. I never played the PC-only sequels to the game that had better match engines, a bit more depth and were apparently almost able to compete with Championship Manager for a little bit, but this original title is one that's filled with good memories. And seriously, between this and Premier Manager 3, I have to say that my knowledge of the Vauxhall Conference and its team circa 94-95 is freaking second to none. I mean, I could put that useless trivia up on Mastermind if I wanted to. <laughs> Bye for now. Today we look at one that got away. The memory still haunts me. That second PlayStation football vid. It was there for the playing. It had Big One Atkinson on commentary, a big star on the front, a developer on its last legs in the back. And then the bloody game didn't work. We never quite got to see what David Beckham's soccer was truly about, didn't we? But you know me, I can't possibly let anything go, especially not something so critical and important. So now I get to finally show you David Beckham soccer in all of its glory. I know that all of you have been waiting for this moment for so long. But this will be a bit more than just a look at an old football game, mind you. We also have a studio to look at here as well, Rage Software. David Beckham soccer turned out to be a crucial game for them, and alas, not in a good way. And so we will also ponder the following question. Did the signing of David Beckham cause the death of a games company? David Beckham's soccer is one of the last of a certain race of sports games, ones that concentrate almost totally on one single star. Such games were a lot more common in the earlier days, in fact they were the norm. We had the likes of Pele Soccer, Pete Sampras Tennis, Ryan Giggs Football, Kevin Keegan's Football Manager, Emlyn Hughes International Soccer, Jimmy White's Whirlwind Snooker, and of course the undisputed champion, the greatest looking sports game ever made, Graham Souness's Vector Soccer. I tell you folks, when this doozy was released, people truly thought that it was never, ever going to get better than this. I'm serious. Honest, Gov. These games are generally notable for featuring just the single licence, one for the player itself. Hell, in some cases, you don't even get that. You can't actually play as Pele in the Pele for the Mega Drive, shockingly. Not that you'd want to play Pele for the Mega Drive anyway, because it's horrifically shit. For the most part though, the big star's there, and as you'd expect, they're the best player in the game, or they act as a final boss. Mike Tyson in Punch-Out, Evander Holyfield in Real Deal Boxing, Pete Sampras Tennis. At the end of the game, to be the man, you've got to beat the man. Of course that works better for individual sports as opposed to team games like this one, but still the team with the cover star in it is probably a safe bet when it comes to the team you should pick. As time went on and games with proper licences for teams, leagues, bodies and what have you became common, the cover star sports game gradually faded away. People generally preferred to have more than just one actual real person in the game, don't you know? But in the early 2000s, there was certainly one guy who could carry a sports game all on his own, because he was undoubtedly the most famous sportsman not just in Britain, but in the entire world. So in order to understand why Rage would go for the official David Beckham licence, we have to look at Beckham himself. 
because that's such an obscure subject, obviously. Just what caused Beckham mania? What exactly led to a kid from Leytonstone who was pretty good at football to become the biggest sportsman on the planet? There are no doubt many unofficial, the true story biographies of Bex that you could buy from your local Poundland that would try to answer this question, but there's obviously a few things involved. The baseline being that he was, you know, pretty good at football. He played for the biggest team, Man United, he was very good at a free kick, and probably one of the best crosses of the ball in the history of the game. So there's that, obviously. You have to be decent at football to at least have a chance. But of course, there's more. Even early on you had pictures of him going around in sarongs and showing off a very trendy fashion sense that ten years previously would have, well, not exactly fit the image of a professional footballer. I mean, what is this? Footballers are supposed to have perms. They need to stink of brute and high karate. If needs be, they might wear an ill-fitting suit if they've got to go to court, but other than that, it's on with the polo shirt, down with the five pints of Carlin before a game, and up for training at eight in the fucking morning. What the bloody hell's this? He's a bloody whoopsie shirtlift, so he is. Beckham in every way represented the new, sleek and trendy face of the modern game, something the old guard still fought against. He'd be mocked, but whenever Bex was spotted with something new, particularly a haircut, guaranteed half the country's younger population would be sporting it before the week was out. He was a fashion icon. And then, let's not just pass up those haircuts because they were so very mockable. Those classic mid-90s curtains, he had them. The hairband and ponytail combo he'd usually sport when he moved to Spain, <laughs> dear lord. There was the ultimate sign of punk truly being dead and buried, the tiny little David Beckham mohawk if you could even call it that. And of course, worst of all, the David Beckham cornrows. I mean, what exactly was he thinking here? Even he regrets them now, and I'm sure a lot of people who imitated this style regret them too. But I'll ask you this, back in the mid noughties when Lee's rows were sported, everyone mocked them but otherwise didn't bat an eyelid. Can you imagine the absolute fit that would occur on social media if Beckham decided to rock Lee's cornrows now? Good lord it'd be horrendous. Anyway, I digress. Obviously there's other things, successful team, all of fashion, and of course, the wife. Victoria from the Spice Girls. Posh and Bex, the er celebrity couple that you could not escape from. Seriously, once their coupling became a thing, they were inescapable. It was even considered a worldwide event of massive importance when Beckham signed for LA Galaxy. What's going to happen now that they're going to America? Oh my god, the hype and all that. Like the Kardashians on steroids. Look, it was crazy and, you know what, I'm just going to stop talking about this before I basically turn into Entertainment Weekly. As you can imagine, there was pushback, especially early on, but also something of a story, and a good one. Beckham's relationship with fans and the press went from one extreme to the other over the course of three years, and rather than all the other bullshit, I would like to think of the story as the real making of him as a superstar. At the 98 World Cup, Beckham was on the England team but, oft frustrated at not being picked despite fantastic club performances and taking opportunities for England whenever he could. In the second round against Argentina, this manifested itself. Brought down by Diego Simeone, he kicked out at him from the ground. Simeone promptly went down and Beckham was sent off. England went on to lose the game from the penalty spot. In the fallout, Beckham, unfairly perhaps, had all of the blame put on him. In over 25 years of being a fan of sports, consuming so much sport, I still can't think of anyone who earned quite as much vitriol in the press, especially not a home player, as Beckham did in 1998. He was literally hand in effigy outside a pub. Scorned everywhere, his image spat on in the street. Death threats, so many death threats. Beckham had let down the entire nation. How soon we forget that, you know, the manager was a bloody nut job who relied on a fortune teller for tactics and we didn't have a cat in hell's chance of winning to begin with. Apparently David Beckham, and only Beckham, had screwed up. And the sheer hatred that spewed from all orifices would have been enough to end a lot of footballers' careers. But Beckham got his head down. In the short term he was a key part of Man United's treble winning 98-99 season. The booze still ran out at England games, however. 
After one game, a 3-2 defeat against Portugal in Euro 2000 where he'd set up both England goals, he responded in a very human way by telling a group of England supporters who'd been heckling him all game that they were number one. Still, as England went through a transitional period, he became more important, ultimately earning the captaincy. The World Cup 2002 qualifying campaign would become his redemption, starring in that incredible 5-1 thrashing of Germany for a start. But above everything else, there was Greece, the final game of the campaign, at his home stadium of Old Trafford. Now I know sport isn't necessarily of interest to a fair few people on the channel, but sport has stories that you just can't write. You may well know where this is going already, but stick with it. In the last seconds of a thoroughly awful performance, England are 2-1 down to Greece and facing the uncertainty of a playoff to qualify for the tournament. Teddy Sheringham is fouled, eight yards outside the penalty area. David Beckham, after three years of savage treatment in the press, getting his head down, earning the captaincy, stands over the ball. If he scores, England qualify for the World Cup automatically. So was that treatment going through his mind? Or was he just thinking about where he was going to put it? In the end, we may never know. Because after all, in the light of victory, it doesn't really matter. Footballer in the world. Yes! Yes for England! David Beckham has done it big time! Well, if anyone else... The redemption arc was completed. With the free kick that secured automatic qualification to the World Cup, Beckham was a national hero. Just as few sports stars have been as vilified as he was in 1998, few were as lionised as he was in 2001 after that free kick. Beckham was now an idol. And it is at this moment, there or thereabouts, that we come to David Beckham soccer, in fact precisely at this moment, with the redemption arc at its completion. This is why, even at such a late stage for cover star games, David Beckham is enough of a big name to sell a game entirely on its own. At least, that's what Rage Software, the folks behind the game, are banking on. Rage first came to most folks' attention with the Striker games, and to be honest, as far as 16-bit footy games go, they're pretty good, fast and arcadey, seemingly always on Games Master to boot, and they sold very well indeed. The 90s had largely been spent increasing the company's size and profile, floating on the stock market in 1996, and actually bucking the trend somewhat in that Rage, come the 32-bit era, were a company who were still standing whereas lots of older, more established companies had started to fall. Hell, Rage were continuing to grow, they had offices all over the north of the country, things were looking good. In 1999 they decided to make an even bigger step, they went into publishing, a big step indeed, one that ups the costs by a fair bit, one that needs a big name or two. And this was where Rage had run into a bit of a sticky patch. While they'd survived in the PS1 era, the slow rollout of the PS2 and Xbox was hurting them in 2000, to the point where they had to cancel titles. Then they had to do the bad thing. As a public company, they needed to go out and announce that they were losing money. Eight million pounds to be precise. Shares had fallen from 78 pence to 6 pence in the space of a year. But it was okay. At the same time as they broke that news to investors in March of 2000, they also broke the news that they'd signed David Beckham. They'd be the only company to make games officially endorsed by Bex in a three year deal, with David Beckham Soccer naturally being the first of them. Rage themselves would make the game for the PS1 and PS2, while Majesco and Yo Yo would handle Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color. Naturally, cue massive marketing campaign. It's your chance to play as the world's most famous number seven. And geez, you can do it on most anything that's out there. David Beckham Soccer is a rare opportunity to experience a game on no less than four technologically different platforms, from the essentially 8-bit Game Boy Color to the sleek and modern PlayStation 2. And did I mention that Big One Atkinson was on the commentary? In those days before that N-word filled rant about Marcel Desailly? David Beckham Soccer is your chance to, once again, experience a sports game where the man on the cover is the only one who has his real name intact. It seems like a sure thing, doesn't it? Well, Wage certainly hopes so. What with the problems that publishing has brought up, the company is on a downturn. Essentially, they're banking it all on David Beckham. This game has to be a success. 
and so it's time to look at it. But not on PS2. Believe it or not, the game first came out on PS1 in November of 2001, a month after that free kick. So as that's the lead platform, we've got to go there first. And, um, oh dear. Sorry, but this game is a very bad slice of footy indeed. It's actually quite a shocker just how bad this one is. Not just because Rage had made decent football games before, but, well, look at the date. This is late 2001. There were a lot of very decent and even quite good looking football games for the PlayStation by now. So what's this about? There's no good excuse for a game to look this shoddy and slapdash over six years into the life of a system. This looks and feels like a huge step back with commentary you can barely hear, faces that look like they've been punched by an anvil. It's nasty. You can read an actual biography of David Beckham though, away from massive text files tacked onto games. This is only slightly less gripping than In the Darkness of Shadow Moses as it happens. There's other little options here and there, the odd inclusion of an arcade fighting game style survival mode for example, or a very extensive training mode which to be honest is probably as good as the game gets, because playing it is really not good, as nasty as it looks it plays worse. It feels like you're moving through clay, like you're barely in control of your team. And that's bad enough, but your team is useless. When the opposition's bearing down on goal, they're basically nowhere to be found. I don't know if I've ever had less fun trying to defend than I have here. Geez, even when you get a tackle in, the ball almost always goes straight back to the opposition. The passing is awful. It's nothing but to feet and half the time the ball just gets intercepted. Through balls? <laughs> nope, none of that. The shooting feels random. Seriously, I've somehow managed to miss an open bloody goal from two yards out in this game, even though all I did was tap the button. Player selection? Non-existent. This feels like a game where everything is working against you. There's no balance, and it's all just knocked together and held up by Prit Stick. With the best will in the world and all the different fins there are, hell, even some classic matches, nothing can change the game being virtually unplayable. It doesn't exactly get better on other formats as well. The handheld formats, which employ a striker-esque top-down view, are, if anything, worse. The Game Boy Color version might be the easiest footy game ever made. Seriously, you simply walk down the pitch without being challenged and then score a goal past a keeper who barely bothers to dive. Game Boy Advance? Basically the same, but the graphics are slightly better. But the sheer silence of the game makes it feel like an unfinished demo. And then there's PS2. PS2 is the best version, yes, it does fix a few things that are wrong with the PS1 game, it doesn't feel stupendously broken, but I would hesitate to actually call it a good game, mind you. There are many things that I simply don't get about David Bacon Soccer, such as the fact that the PS1 version was released in November 2001 and the others came out in June 2002. That's kind of odd to say the least. I wonder why. Now I'm not sure and I can't find anything concrete, but let's project a bit. Is it possible that the PS1 game was rushed out in order to try and capture Beckham's colossal wave of momentum? There was a reason why I went on about that at the start after all. This game was released right when he was the absolute hottest thing going. The rest were released in June 2002, which is a better time for a football game. That would have coincided with the start of the 2002 World Cup. It's possible that this PS1 game was rushed out without quite being finished, considering the technical problems it has. Who knows, maybe it would have been better if Beckham hadn't scored that goal against Greece. Of course, this is all speculation, but it wouldn't surprise me. It also wouldn't surprise me if the money situation at Rage had become so bad that quite simply they had to get something out there right now in order to stem the loss of blood. Such is the problem when you're a publisher and a developer. When you're developing, you aren't exactly releasing much in the way of games, therefore you aren't making much money. Let's remember, Rage were in a very bad way. So, whatever they did, you can't really blame them. And alas, David Beckham would not change things. As big as Beckham was, a PS1 release in November of 2001 is hardly going to set the shelves on fire. PS2 was firmly established at this point as the main platform in town. The PS2 version didn't exactly perform well either, nor did the Game Boy games. Ultimately, well, what was the point of a game like this? Like, if I want to play as David Beckham, I can do it on FIFA, or Pro Evo. 
and I can play as a lot of other big stars too. I don't need a game where only the big star has his actual name and likeness in it. This game didn't exactly do much to stop the FIFA juggernaut, and in the end I don't think the actual quality of the game had much to do with that. It just feels a bit out of time. There is one other little thing that's worth covering. The other way Wage used their David Beckham license. For a platformer. One of the stranger licensed games around. Go Go Beckham for the Game Boy Advance, released in 2002. Play as a young kiddie version of Beckham as you go around various stages, using your football to collect items and beat baddies. The game was made by Dundee based studio Denki, one of their first games. And shockingly, it's not bad at all. It's a quite decent cutesy platformer, kind of in a similar vein to the classic Yoshi's Island. It's very fun to kick a ball around, there's secrets, a nice difficulty curve. It works, it might be the best platform game ever where you control a football. So you know it's better than Marco's Magic Football, Hurricanes and Soccer Kid. But it is a surprisingly decent game. Unfortunately though, it wasn't a sales success either. And what was the upshot of all of this? Well, I can't imagine that the David Beckham license came cheap. Rage must have spent a fair amount of money on getting such a big name, and for the games to then not perform? Well, that wasn't good. Indeed, it would turn out to be a fatal blow for the company. In 2002, reports came thick and fast that Rage was struggling big time. A 300 strong group by this point, they suddenly went into a downward spiral. Rocky, their other big license, didn't do much to stem the tide. Other licenses for a gaggle of apparently successful inline skaters? Well, those just never came out. The company was in its death throes. And so it was time for EVAC. A sister company, Swordfish, was set up in Birmingham in late 2002, and they acquired Wage for the princely sum of £1. At which point it was promptly liquidated. Wage bit the dust in early 2003. Swordfish continued as a developer only, being passed around like a hot potato by both Vivendi and ultimately Codemasters. The initial Birmingham studio still runs to this day as Codemasters Birmingham. The cost of publishing their games as well as developing them was another factor in the demise of Rage. For all that had gone well in the previous years, there seems to be a point where they flew too close to the sun and their winds caught fire. And that point may well have been David Beckham. They weren't able to escape the fate of many a British games company before them, especially those who'd tried to expand. They may not have been the best studio ever or anything like that, but still, it was a speedy end and an example of just how quickly things can go wrong in the video game business. You may think that you're sticking money on a sure fin, and hell, said sure fin even does fins that you would think would only increase your chance of success. But in the end, the public just doesn't respond. Such is the danger of licences when you spend so much money on them. They can make you, but they can also utterly break you. Bye for now! It's been quite a while since I've done a video that's football related. I've certainly done a fair few in my time, whether it's covering the best and the worst footy games from platforms like the Spectrum, PlayStation or the Arcade, to seeing what happens when you don't bother controlling any of the players in a game. I'm quite prolific. A champion of a genre, old football games, that, well, not many others care about. But then a fair few people have been wanting me to go back. They often crop up in comments or even in person wondering when another footy game vids come in. And you know what? Having a look at the sheer awfulness that was World Championship Soccer on the Spectrum has given me the urge to do another one. So what's the plan? This is a compilation of sorts. I've picked out 10 football games from 10 different platforms. In the spirit of World Championship Soccer however, we're not looking at good games. Instead of that, I have a bunch of titles ranging from utterly weird affairs to, well, flat out stinkers. The worst football games you can possibly imagine. They don't make them quite this bad anymore, it has to be said. So sit back, pour yourself some sponsor approved beverage of sorts, and let's dive deep into the vaults of soccer horror. 
First up, here's one from the good old Mega Drive. Now there's many footsie games on here, and they're not necessarily all that bad, even when you get outside of the more traditionally decent likes of FIFA, ISS and Sensi. But then, well, there's Pele by Accolade. The studio that graced the system with the likes of Bubsy and Balls also saw fit to put out this football game, featuring the endorsement of a certain Mr Edson Arantes do Nascimento, or you know, Pele. The Brazilian legend hadn't had much luck with football games before. If you're aware of Pele Soccer on the Atari 2600, you probably know this. Even in a world largely made up of differently coloured squares, this was arguably the worst sports game on the age-old machine. Perhaps Accolade could do better then, and give Pele a football game worthy of his immortal standing. Um, no, they could not. Pele is unquestionably the worst football game on the Mega Drive. You might look at it and think it looks like a rather humdrum affair, but trust me, this is truly horrendous to play. How so? Well, for a start, the controls are utterly balked. Even moving the players around doesn't seem to make all that much sense. Pressing up and left, for example, doesn't move you directly up or down the pitch, even though the game is isometric, instead moving you at an angle, which is really confusing. It's hard to get this, but basically, play FIFA 95 and then play this, <laughs> and you'll notice the difference. And that's not all. A lot of the time the computer likes to do things for you, particularly tackling. Great! Nine times out of ten, the bloody CPU just fouls the opponent, which is always annoying because you get this display every time. Yay! They managed to include some low quality pictures or video even into the game. Look, just bloody get on with it, why don't you? Seriously, you get sick of this like the second time you see it. It just gets worse, really. There's nonsensical offsides. Sometimes you'll be called offside even when you're halfway up the pitch. Here, the opposing goalie accidentally chucks the ball to me and somehow this gets called offside. I'm pretty sure that's not how the game works. And there's only one real way to score. One up the touchline and try to cross the ball in for a header. Nothing else really works as the keepers just save every regular shot. Add all of this together and you have a game that's utterly appalling. Nothing can save it, certainly not the lousy sound effects or those bloody little videos that play every time something happens. Ah, poor old Pele. Somehow the game actually got a sequel to tie in with the 94 World Cup. This weirdly seems a bit more cleaned up even if it's still not good. The original however? Abysmal. Even your local retro game shop will probably just give this bloody thing to you if you ask them nicely enough. It seems right that after opening with a Mega Drive game, we go straight to the competition. Again though, it's a similar story. I can't think of too many football games on the SNES that are outright hideous. Sure, there's some bad ones and some dull ones, a lot of dull ones to be honest, but nothing truly horrendous comes to mind. But here I found one that I would call, well, Definitely weird. It's Tony Miola's Sidekick Soccer. Now the first question I had on finding out about this game was naturally, who the hell is Tony Miola? Wikipedia tells me he was the US's national goalkeeper back in the 1990s and a successful one at that. Still, I can think of more famous American players from the time who'd probably be more deserving. Kobe Jones, perhaps? I know Alexi Lalas already had a game. Anyway, I digress. This game is by Sculptured Software, and one thing these guys like to do with their sports games is play around with pseudo 3D. And that's what you get here, a display that's quite different to most other 16-bit games. Maybe with a bit more polish it could work, but ugh. You know what? Playing this game actually gives me motion sickness, something I don't often suffer from. Is it the juddery gameplay? Perhaps, but... The main thing is that the camera is always going 180 degrees with each turnover in possession, and it happens so much that, yeah, this just gives me a headache. Aside from that, I mean the actual football isn't necessarily horrible to play, although it is a bit dull, and I'd class this as more of a weird affair than one that's actually terrible, but on the other hand, the pseudo 3D nonsense makes it kind of unpalatable. Sculptured Software tried, I suppose, but... Alas, like most of their games, the end result was, well, not to put it too bluntly, crap. 
So there's a little starter course, two 16-bit games. You may think they look perfectly terrible, but we certainly have worse games coming up. How about we go to the 8-bits for one? Something that has the audacity to bill itself as great, even. Yep, we could only be talking about Great Soccer for the Sega Master System, or the Mark III if you're in Japan. Much like Nintendo did with the Famicom, Sega peppered the early entries into the Master System's catalogue with various generic sports games, only in an attempt to try and make them stand out, they gave them the moniker of Great. Great Basketball, Great Tennis, Great Golf, and so on. Unfortunately, if you've played any of these games, you'll know that they're anything but great. Seriously, even for early sports titles on a new system, they are lousy. They certainly weren't showcases for what the new system could do, and they probably didn't help the Master System get off the ground in any way. And of all these great sports titles, Great Soccer is, without a doubt, the least great. Which is to say, it's bloody wretched. The sprites are perhaps what sticks out the most. I mean, they're so deformed and stupid looking that you can't help but laugh at the game right off the bat. But then the actual playing of it is so slow. It's like they're trying to run in treacle. And this awful, cheap game can't even scroll properly. You get up to the top or bottom half of the screen, and then it flicks over to the end of the pitch. Scoring isn't exactly tricky once you slowly waddle to the area and get a shot off, but just trying to play this is comedy. Seriously, I was laughing my head off while trying to play this game. Even when you compare this game to its equivalent, the original NES Soccer, like, that's not good at all, but it's wonderful when compared to this codswallop. As bad as this was, it did manage to get a sequel of sorts called World Soccer, although confusingly this game was released as Great Soccer in the US. This game is apparently better, and it makes use of the Sega Sports Pad. I have to say I'm not sure about playing any sort of football game with a trackball, but I'll happily take people's word that it's better than the original hopeless mess of a game. Ok, next up we're going for something that's a bit more weird. There's a few football games to be found on the venerable Game Boy, and some of them are pretty bloody decent for the handheld. It actually plays a crack in sensible soccer, believe it or not. But the most unique of them? Well, that's undoubtedly Magnetic Soccer, a game made by, believe it or not, Nintendo themselves. It's certainly one of the more obscure first-party Nintendo games out there, that's for sure. I think you can tell pretty quickly why this is unique. This isn't regular football, it's table football, or football as it's often known. I can't think of many other football games aside from cheap little flash games and the like, it has to be said. You move all the players at once from left to right with the D-pad, and you can flick the ball with the buttons or trap it to unleash a more powerful shot. There's different surfaces which can play faster or slower, different skill levels and uh, not much else. I mean, it's football, a game you play in a pub after a few drinks, usually to the annoyance of anyone who happens to be in the vicinity who's trying to have a quiet conversation. Football loses something in translation, it has to be said. The actual game is quite manic as you try and control several rows of footballers in order to stop the ball from going into the net, whereas here they just all move at once, so, well, it's kind of state. It's not a bad game, it's certainly unique, but it's not something I'd ever bother playing again. I kind of wonder how Nintendo ended up making it. Did the football machine in their relaxation room break, and someone thought, hey, why don't we just code a football game that we can play? Was someone complaining about the clacking noise? I don't know. Either way, it exists. That's as much as can really be said. But speaking of tabletop variations on football, well, how about Sabutio? A classic British institution. You and another player get their teams together, they're happily balanced on weighted bases, and you take it in turns to flick those players at the ball, ideally putting a good move together and getting it in the goal. It's a different, more strategic game perhaps than regular football, with its own set of rules, and a fair bit of skill. There's a knack to flicking the players correctly, and a lot of extras such as different kits, additions to the arena that can really set the mood. This is one of the main games that inspired John Hare to create the almighty Sensible Soccer. He wanted to make something similar that could be a world of football all on its own. 
However, on the spectrum, as Derek Findas would say, in the early 90s, Goliath Games decided to take a more direct approach. They created a computer game based on Sabutio. For some reason. The rules and general method of playing is much the same. You control the power and direction of your flick through power bars here, as opposed to, I don't know, flicking the TV screen. Much like regular Sabutio, you can keep a move going so long as you don't hit an opposing player. There's specific rules for offside, shooting and what have you, defensive flicks, onside flicks. And the action is, of course, strategic and slow paced. Even more so, perhaps, here on a computer. It's Sabutio! And while I can't really fault Goliath's adaptation of the game to computers, it isn't exactly something that translates well. Like, there's board games you can play on a computer, something like Trivial Pursuit or Scrabble or Monopoly that are useful in a pinch if, you know, you can't be asked to get a set out. But Sabutio, it just feels daft. Mainly because, well, why play Sabutio on a computer? Why not play a regular football game instead? Playing Sabutio on a computer removes the fun of the game, the actual flicking, and so it just doesn't really work. A noble effort, but not all that good, really. Okay, back to handhelds. Now here's something. As we all know, a lot of old footy games have endorsements from specific players. We've already had Pele and Tony Miola. And while I didn't know Tony Miola, I can see that he was a successful player. But how about the lamest tie-in? Well, I think I have a contender here. Introducing David O'Leary's Total Soccer 2000 for the Game Boy Color. <laughs> David O'Bloody Leary, who is known for what? Being an Arsenal journeyman and being a mediocre manager, at best. Somehow in 2000, he endorsed a video game. I can only presume that Alan Kerbishley wasn't available. So yes, the tie-in is pretty lame, especially seeing as it isn't even reflected in the game, he's just on the blooming cover. But the game itself, uh, it's a strange one. How so? Well, it's a conversion of a PS1 game. But not just any PS1 game, a PS1 Net Eurosi game. If you enjoyed your Eurosi games on the old demo discs back in the day, you may remember the original Total Soccer. An obviously cheap looking, but fast and actually quite fun attempt at footy. Really not bad at all considering Eurosi's limitations, kinda like a BTEC sensible soccer. Surprisingly, it actually managed to get a commercial upgrade thanks to Ubisoft. But all the fun of Total Soccer gets lost in translation, I'm afraid. This game isn't fast, it's really slow. It's also really easy. This is one of those games where, just with a little bit of dribbling skill, you can happily round the keeper and walk the ball into the net, removing any need to shoot. Never the sign of a good football game, that. There doesn't seem to be any difference in the teams at all. I could do this and score with aplomb as Manchester United against Bradford, and I could do it as Venezia against Real Madrid. It's… it's not a good game at all. A shame. Total Soccer could have been a good one on handhelds too. Although this wasn't the end of it, there's Total Soccer games on the Game Boy Advance too, only David O'Leary has been done away with and replaced by Steven Gerrard, or rather, Stevie Gerrard. This is slightly better I suppose in that you can actually adjust the skill level so that the computer isn't completely idiotic, but it's still very slow indeed and not exactly a game worth plunking from the depths of obscurity. Still it's convenient that we've made it to the Game Boy Advance cause, well, our next game's there. Finding weird soccer games often involves moving away from the realms of reality. There's always going to be something strange that doesn't involve real people. Did you know that there's a Disney soccer game on the Game Boy Advance, for example? You can pit teams captained by the likes of Mickey, Minnie and Goofy and what have you against each other. I thought this would be a contender for the video, but it turns out it isn't anywhere near bad enough for that. I mean, it's obviously a more successful Disney crossover title than, say, Kingdom Hearts. For our Game Boy Advance entry then, we've got something else. We've got LEGO! Here's LEGO Soccer Mania, an isometric game that's very bad indeed. No surprises there, seeing as it was made by Teartex, a legendarily rubbish name from the 8-bit days. They were still pumping out games in the early 2000s. Hell, the company's still around now, although they don't really do games anymore. 
Anyway, LEGO Soccer Mania pits various teams of generic LEGO based ballers against each other. Knights, Wild West and so on. There's nothing special here. And I mean, I don't really need to say a lot here, you can tell it's pretty bad. There's a few power ups here and there, mainly speed up and slow down, but they don't seem to have any effect at all on the gameplay. To be honest, this is revolting, ugly to look at and a bore to play. It makes me think of the old US gold game Fever Pitch, only it's a crippled version of it, and that wasn't a good football game to begin with. This is just the sort of shovelware that was way too common on the Game Boy Advance, alas. As for LEGO, well, this was presumably before the days when someone figured out that LEGO plus popular franchise and an action game equals bags upon bags of money. The little blocks would go on to better things, far away from the football pitch. Up next we may as well go to some offerings that are a bit more street. Again, if you want some weirdness and indeed some awfulness, that's often a good place. As simplified as it is, it turns out it's kind of hard to actually create a decent street football or futsal game or whatever. And we've also got a couple of games on the PlayStation systems here. Now finding new PlayStation footy games to talk about is a challenge being that I've covered a lot of them, but I've definitely got a couple of lousy ones here. First up for the PS1, it's Puma Street Soccer. This is one I remember playing on a demo disc back in the day and thinking that it was particularly cack even back then, so I wanted to see if it was indeed as bad as I remembered. And well, yeah, it is pretty much, even if I've played so many other bad football games that something like this doesn't even really stand out anymore. It is kind of amusing though, the graphics aren't bad but the sound and <laughs> the incredibly unenthusiastic commentary? Stuff like that's just always a laugh as are the comically bad goalkeepers. Seriously, sometimes they'll be beaten just with long balls from the other end of the pitch, let alone the super shots that you can unleash once you've filled the bar up. The end result is basically a rather boring goal fest. Both you and the opponent tend to end up scoring every time you get the ball, and not even in a particularly impressive way, it's all rebounds and shit. FIFA Street may have cringeworthy presentation of its own, but is certainly a hell of a lot more satisfying. And yet, Puma Street Soccer is perhaps not something that really belongs here. Admittedly, if I hadn't already looked at Chris Kamara's Street Soccer in another video, Puma Street Soccer probably wouldn't be here at all. That's how much of the PSX library we've plundered. Still, it was fun to go back to this game that I'm pretty sure got about 3 out of 10 in the same official PlayStation mag that featured it on the demo disc which kind of makes you wonder why they bothered wasting disc space on it at all. So let's have a look at the PS2. Most everyone now agrees that the PS2 is very much a retro system, it's 20 years old next year after all, don't that make you feel ancient? We're becoming more familiar with the many gems of the machine, both the famous and the hidden, but we're also getting more knowledge of the system's great purveyors of crap. People like Phoenix Games. An absolute stinker of a budget studio, more and more people are becoming aware of the utter bollocks that they unleashed through their relatively short career. You might immediately be thinking of the beyond ridiculous Animal Soccer World, one of the most laughably pathetic attempts at telling a narrative in the entire history of video games. However, that game doesn't really have much actual football in it. So here's something else from the Phoenix Library. City Soccer Challenge. Yes, it's another street football game. And, <laughs> well, it is certainly worthy of the Phoenix name. You get some generic teams, pick a couple of them, and you're off. And indeed, literally just pick a couple. Half of them are locked off anyway, meaning there's like four to choose from. And, well, away we go. My first thoughts on loading a match were mainly based on how disgusting the game looks. Like, we've seen a lot of ugly games in this video already, but short of the last game we're covering, this is the most offensive to my eyes. Everything about the way the game looks and the characters on the pitch is grotesque. The very worst of 2000's shovelware graphics. It makes Crazy Frog Racer look good. And the gameplay, shockingly enough, isn't much better. Everyone is so slow, you 
get some special abilities that are signified by trails from the player that presumably came from some free graphical trail CD. The goalkeepers are utterly beyond hope and you usually score even when you shoot straight at them and everyone moves around like they've had their heads and feet cut off. And there's an overabundance of impact font, which is the worst font in the world next to Comic Sans. There's nothing at all that's even of an acceptable standard here. But then that's what people have come to expect from Phoenix. City Soccer Challenge is terrible, but guess what? It isn't even that bad for this studio. Atrocious. So we have one more game, and like Jose Mourinho, it's a special one. I've called a lot of football games the worst over the years, everything from inept PlayStation affairs to comedy ZX Spectrum titles. Really though, they've all been placeholders, keeping the seat warm until finally I got my chance to cover the true final boss of bad football games, the champion in all categories, particularly the one called why the hell does this even exist? And finally, it's time. We're off to the Amiga, and we're going to put Graham Souness Vector Soccer on the throne where it belongs. Now I suppose you can't fault Zeppelin's ambition. It really takes some balls to try and put a 3D football game out in 1991, for the Amiga and the Atari ST no less. But this is the end result. You have these hideously gruesome 3D figures running about. And I say running, but well, the game runs at less than a frame per second. It's so unresponsive that you would be better off posting your inputs to the computer. So slow that you could do one of those old Twitch plays fins for this game, and the end result wouldn't look any different to a single human player trying to wrestle with it. You basically can't do anything other than move in a straight line, it's not even worth bothering trying to do anything else. That's if you're not laughing too hard from the bloody state of this fin. But all isn't lost, you can actually make the game faster. Just go into the match detail and turn, well basically everything off. Now the game might actually hit 5 frames per second. But <laughs> if you thought it was bad before, just look at it now. Now when a player isn't near the ball, they literally become a floating square. <laughs> this looks less like football and more of an attempt at abstract art. And none of this helps the gameplay anyway. You may score every now and then or even put some sort of move together in slow motion, but this is just hilarious. A few years later when 3D football games started to become the norm, needless to say, Graham Souness Vector Soccer was not recognised as a trailblazer. It's awful now. It was awful then, and even if there's some games that could beat it for incompetence, I kind of think this has to take its rightful position as the most hilariously bad footy game ever released. It's the total package. And well, there we have it. 10 football games plucked out of obscurity and presented for your entertainment. Not the best ones, but certainly very funny ones. But as an actual fan of footy games, Perhaps next time I should bring some balance by highlighting actual decent ones that people may not know about, seeing as the games in this video have been so dreadful. Eh, I don't know. I mean, let's face it, you kinda need to have a love of the beautiful game in virtual form to know of and seek out these little brown treasures, it has to be said. <laughs> Bye for now! If you mention Championship Manager to a group of gamers, chances are half of them are going to break out into a massive smile and start detailing just how much they loved the game, regaling each other with long and detailed anecdotes of their greatest runs and club legends who took some minnows from the middle of nowhere all the way to the Champions League, while the other half of people sit bored stiff and wonder just what the bloody hell these people are on. If you're into games and you like a bit of footy, well, you've probably got some cracking Championship Manager tales, or indeed Football Manager if you're still into the games now. You've spent your time in one of the most addictive games known to man, and you've got the war stories to prove it. 
These games are the undisputed kins of football management. Really, there's probably no other genre where the gap is so large between first and second. Once a creation of two Everton-supporting brothers named Paul and Oliver Collier from their Shropshire bedroom over the summer holidays that wasn't intended for any audience beyond their schoolmates, it's now a whopping great monolith, something that's both a game and close to being an almanac of football, featuring just about any team that currently exists and every single person who's ever so much as kicked a neighbour's kid's ball back over their fence. In a way, it's the closest thing that the beautiful game has to cricket's immortal wisdom, only with an interactive element. There's basically nothing that you can't do in current Football Manager, to the point where for some folks it can almost be too intimidating. A game where micromanagement before a match can take even longer than it would take to watch said match in real time. For those people, including myself, they're more content to stick with what they know and grew up with. And chances are, that means Championship Manager 0102. At least for me. And hell, it's got a long-standing fan website named after it and everything. The people who might think that Champman fans need to bloody sort themselves out will likely wonder how the hell something that looks so dry can be so addicting for people. Whether it's Championship or Football Manager, the game has resolutely gone against all trends and technical innovations. Even the original Amiga title was utterly outdated in terms of graphics for 1992, almost any other footy manny title looks nicer, and basically 99% of the game has always been text. It took until 2003 and Championship Manager 4 for the game to actually include a 2D match engine, and when the game finally did go 3D years later, a lot of people were furious about it. All the Championship Manager 2 and 3 games feature nothing but a running text commentary, a whole host of canned phrases with players' names shoved into them, and the closest thing to graphical flair is the text box flashing when a goal is scored. For many people, this is the only true way to play the game. Who cares if it's only text when the tension and drama's so high? Every time the action stops for a bout of commentary, you don't know what's coming. Is your team about to construct a beautiful goal, only for the end shot to be blazed over the bar? And now the other side are coming at you, you're hoping for a tackle. Eventually you're just hoping for a foul even, and... Oh my god, the bloody keeper spilt the shot, but your defenders reclaimed it. Oh, thank god, and now he's going forward, but wait, he's lost it. The opposing team's forward shoots and it's a bloody goal. But wait... It's been disallowed. Oh, the flag was up. Oh, football, eh? Bloody hell. That's Championship Manager commentary. And yes, it's quite exciting. It's like a rapid fire and rather complex set of dice rolls, each new line adding to the tension. It is quite wonderful what you can do with so little. This is the sort of thing that gets us classic Championship Manager fans going, that makes us so passionate and fond of the games, and keeps us going at it years later, whether we're using an updated pool of players that brings any one of the old games right into the 2020s, or we're still kicking around with the same group of lads from any time between 1992 and 2004, depending on what version you love. It took people and critics a little bit of time to really learn to love it, it wasn't until the second iteration of the first game, Championship Manager 93, the first to use real players, that the series started to gather steam and sell copies. Even the sequel didn't necessarily receive a warm greeting. A flabbergasted PC gamer stuck 49% on it and basically said that this old load of crap from the Amiga days should be shoved into a care home. However, people didn't give a toss about any of that, and the game sold hundreds of thousands of copies. The 97-98 season update of CM2, which is where I came in, was the UK's best-selling PC game of 1997. Through not giving even the slightest shit about fashion, and also through being something of a heartwarming grassroots story of these two brothers and their own little company, Sports Interactive, creating such a tremendously detailed world of football, it became all the rage anyway. And yes, we do still talk about it a hell of a lot. Those of us who grew up with Championship Manager can happily bore the arse off of anybody who doesn't follow footy and doesn't see the appeal of this slightly tarted up collection of spreadsheets and words at a moment's notice, and we can make legends out of people who you'd likely never know if it wasn't for the game. 
The best thing about the series, and what I want to mainly focus on in this video, whether it's the classic game I know and love or the modern titles that are out now, is the finding, scouting, signing and nurturing of obscure players from lord knows where. It's all about hunting down someone, paying a pittance for them and watching as they become one of the best players in the world. The sheer size of the game's database utterly allows for this road to glory, and it resulted in the creation of a rather unique group of players, the Legends of Championship Manager. Most of the Legends of Championship Manager are players who didn't really amount to too much in real life. There's a few exceptions to the rule, of course, but if it wasn't for the game, most of these guys wouldn't be that well known or even known at all. Many players could be classed as CM Legends and sometimes it's quite a personal thing, although when it comes to CM0102 there's a good few names in particular that make people's eyes light up. Names like Mark Kerr, Kim Kellstrom, Tonton Zola Mukoko, Maxim Shigalko and Cherno Samba. Just these five represent a good spread of talent. Of the quintet, only Kellstrom really went on to have a lasting career at football's top level, playing for the likes of Lyon and Arsenal, winning several honours as a player and being capped 131 times by Sweden. The others are a bit less known. Midfield monster Mark Kerr, 19 in CMO 102's world, never ventured too far outside of Scottish football. Mukoko, a Congolese-Swedish central midfield linchpin, had his career derailed by personal tragedy, the death of his elder brother, and sadly spent most of his football in years yomping around lower division clubs in Sweden and Finland, but CM fans still call him up just to thank him for their team's successes to this very day. In 0102, the Belarusian striker Maxim Shigalka can be signed for peanuts from Dinamo Minsk and is soon able to mutilate just about every defence in the world. In real life, he never fulfilled his potential. He retired aged just 25 in 2008, was plagued by ill health after his football career and sadly passed away on Christmas Day last year at the age of only 37. Yeah, it turns out that a few of the stories behind Championship Manager's legends are actually rather sad. And then, well, there's Cherno Samba. With the exception of just one other player who I've yet to mention, Cherno Samba is the textbook definition of a championship manager legend. The striker for Millwall is a feature in many lengthy stories of success in the game. You sign Samba when he's just 16 years old and he quickly becomes just about the perfect striker. Simply put, a footballing god who is several levels above just about anyone that he plays against. Of course, this did not happen in real life. Samba's professional career saw him eventually play for the likes of FC Hacker in Finland and FK Tonsborg in Norway before he retired early due to injury. And yet he's incredibly well known amongst a certain set of people. How does this happen then? What goes into someone like Cherno Samba, who didn't amount to too much in his career, let's be honest, being absolute dynamite in this game? To be fair, a lot of it had to do with Samba having a hell of a lot of potential as a youngster. He represented England all the way up to the under-20s. His in-game stats and incredibly high potential as a 16-year-old player reflect that. It kind of makes sense for the game's research team to give him very impressive marks. Much like other CM legends, that potential was cut short abruptly. At one stage, Samba was basically set to sign for Liverpool and was even pictured with Len boss Gerard Houllier. However, he hadn't signed anything yet and this picture angered Millwall. The deal fell through, Samba resented Millwall greatly for it and soon found himself shipped off to Cadiz in Spain. While at Cadiz, at an incredibly low ebb and suffering from mental health issues due to the failure of the dream Liverpool move, he attempted to take an overdose but was fortunately found in time by his training partner. While Samba's career ended at 29, he harbours no resentment towards championship manager. Indeed, it's brought him a fair bit of fame and recognition. Has he played the game? Well, of course. Not only has he played it, but he usually plays it and signs himself to see what happens. The game has quite a unique appeal for some of these CM legends, it seems. It offers a window to just what could have been. 
Swedish midfielder Kennedy Bakikoglu, another CMO 102 legend, never quite got over failing to impress Manchester United enough in a trial as a youngster and has often spoken of spending many a night playing the game with himself at Man United and living out the career he hoped he would have in the game. However, this isn't always the case and some players are less enthusiastic. Freddy Adu, not only a legend in CMO 304, but someone who was compared to no lesser figure than Pele in the press and basically had the entire future of soccer in the United States placed on his shoulders at the age of 14, harbours a fair bit of resentment towards the game. Just another part of the crazy hype that surrounded him went to his head and resulted in a career that never came close to living up to the wild expectations. Adu is still only 32 years old, but was last seen in 2021 playing for, and ultimately being released by, third-tier Swedish side Osterlund FF. This is the case for a lot of these CM legends, in fact. Tonton Zola Mokoko was at one point regarded as one of the best young players in all of Europe, and the likes of AC Milan were clamouring for his signature. It's quite funny, this game exists at a point where you could also spend not a whole lot of money to bring Cristiano Ronaldo or Wayne Rooney, both of whom were also 16 at the time, to your club. However, while they both tend to turn out quite good, they never reach the level of a Cherno Samba or a Maxim Chicago, or the legend of all legends, the one who we've yet to mention. For as great as all these players I've mentioned are, there is one other that's just a cut above the rest. In the world of Championship Manager 0102, this is a man who, once he reaches his prime, essentially becomes the greatest football player of all time. And that man is Tomadera. Tomadera can be signed by just about any team in the game, aged 22 years old, from the tiny regional side of Club Deportivo de Govea in Portugal. Hell, they're so tiny that you're probably going to need to ensure the maximum database is selected just so that he's even available. Much like most of the folk we've named, he's a striker. And while the others are perhaps a little bit quicker at reaching their best stats, in a few seasons' time Madeira is basically invincible. It's often a pretty worthwhile strategy to pick a team, buy Madeira for a few grand, go on holiday to let him mature for a few seasons, and then come back to basically beat everybody with Tom Madeira. This works no matter what. Even the best sides in the world will not have anyone who is on Madeira's level. In the lower leagues, he's basically a god among men right from the off. Putting him in an atrocious side like, for example, my own team Southend United, is going to make them infinitely better, even if you don't buy anybody else. Amongst fans of Championship Manager, Madeira is revered on high. The ultimate striker. So what's the background of this player who you've most likely never heard of? I mean, obviously, he didn't amount to too much in real life, because otherwise you probably would have heard of him. And yet, you might well say he didn't amount to anything at all. As is the case with quite a lot of Championship Manager legends, they can't all be dual CM and real-life footy legends like Vincent Company. Did he ever leave the regional club he came from? Did he end up pottering around clubs in Estonia or Liechtenstein or North Korea or wherever? Well, no. In fact, the legend of all Championship Manager legends, that is, Tomadera, he never fully existed. Seriously, there is no such senior football player as Tomadera, certainly not in Govea or anywhere else. Now, I mean, surely that's a mistake. This is a game that is after all revered for being as in-depth a football management sim as you can get, with intimate details about thousands of players. So with that in mind, how on earth does a completely non-existent player make it into the game? Well, there is an explanation of sorts, so let's go through it. Tomadera is the creation of one of the volunteers for Sports Interactive who dealt with Portuguese football teams and specifically dealt with CD Govea. Naturally, most of these volunteers would be expected to be quite familiar with the team in question, and so most of the players in the team are indeed real. The volunteer himself, a man named Antonio Lopez, had previously been a youth player at the club, so he was ideal for the job except that he went ahead and cheekily put himself into the game under his childhood nickname Tomadera, meaning of Madeira, as if he'd made the transition to senior football. 
Oh, and he'd become the best player in the world, easily capable of bursting the net over 60 times in a season at his peak. Antonio Lopez probably thought that no one would notice his little inclusion. Hell, he'd actually done it for the first time in the previous game, CM0001, putting himself and a couple of other childhood friends into the team, although his stats weren't quite as overblown the first time around and therefore he wasn't discovered. So if anything, he decided to be even cheekier the second time around by making himself into a soccer god and meddling with the primordial forces of nature. But naturally it didn't take long for Madeira to be found by players of the game and for message boards to light up with people talking about how amazing this Portuguese striker was that they'd just found in a completely unknown team and paid a pittance for. It was as if some Conference North team just so happened to have a prime era Gabriel Batistuta on their books. And in fact, it wasn't just fans who were discovering Madeira. By this time, Championship Manager was so respected not just as a game, but as a resource for finding footballers, that actual real-life football clubs were using the game as a scouting tool. Legend even has it that then Glasgow Rangers manager Alex McLeish's son John once tried to persuade his dad to sign a young player he'd discovered through the game in the depths of Barcelona's B team by the name of Lionel Messi. Although Alex swiftly dismissed his son's scouting report saying that this teenager was going to be the best player in the world or some stupid shit like that and we were sadly robbed of the chance to see Messi trying to get the job done on a wet Wednesday night at Pittadry Stadium. I'm getting off topic a little, but in any case, I wager that C.D. Govea probably got quite a few faxes and phone calls from very big clubs indeed, inquiring about this Tomadera that everyone's been talking about, if he was on the books and what their asking price was, and they were no doubt quite confused indeed. So, needless to say, it didn't take awfully long for Sports Interactive to find out about Lopez's meddling. It surprised him really, as he'd expected the studio probably had tools at their disposal to detect obviously fake and ridiculous players like Tomadera and swiftly wipe them out of the database, but instead he'd slipped through the cracks. He may not have been silly to think that this would be the case. With the game's hundreds of volunteer researchers being so utterly essential to the game, Sports Interactive had to keep a bit of an eye on them. Over-enthusiastic and somewhat biased researchers wildly overrating and beefing up the stats of the teams they supported was a problem SI and the Colliers often had to deal with, and this was an even more blatant case of that. However, this time around it just got overlooked. That and, also, he was hardly the first fake player in the game, even. Not only is it an important part of playing CM as your career goes on, to use scouts and keep an eye out for regens of legendary players spawning after they retire with brand new names, because they almost always end up being amazing, but the database did have a few other little easter eggs at various points, including the Collier brothers themselves, who could occasionally be found as players in championship manager games. Now, of course, the difference between these two and Madeira is that Paul and Oliver Collier are completely useless players who you wouldn't choose for your team even if they were the last two people with working feet on the planet. Not someone who can essentially crash it into the top corner from 40 yards with their little toe. And so the only way you can experience Tomadera is if you play the game with the original database out of the box. If you download the database update and patch it in, Madeira will naturally have been completely removed, never to feature in a championship manager game again. Not that him being a fake player has ever really stopped people from using him. Only those who are utterly insistent about keeping a completely authentic side on their books would pass up the opportunity to deploy Madeira in their squad. Sports Interactive themselves have embraced the legend somewhat. When a Sunday league team made up of past and present SI employees was formed in 2011, they called the team FC Tomadera in honour of the game's best-known fake footballer. Plenty of people have noticed some amusing parallels here. Madeira is essentially CMO102's Cristiano Ronaldo, far more so than the actual Cristiano Ronaldo who is also in the game. Hell, he even comes from the island of Madeira, which just so happens to be where CR7 is from. 
The similarities are such that some have even wondered if Tomadir is actually supposed to flat out be Cristiano Ronaldo from the not too distant future, meaning that this unassuming football game is subject to a time paradox that even Hideo Kojima would gawp at. That's a rather amusing spin on the whole thing, although it is obviously not the case. It's just some guy screwing around. And in doing so well, all he really did in the end was add his own part to the glorious legend and irreplaceable all-time classic footy management sim that is Championship Manager 0102. And there's not too much wrong with that really, is there? Bye for now!